Working as a park ranger, I often heard fascinating stories from other rangers at the end of our long shifts. The banter between all of us helped pass the time and took our minds off the exhaustion. One particular story I had heard multiple times caught my attention. It was too detailed and bizarre to be a simple joke or tall tale. But that's what I thought at the time. My friend, Silas McArdle, and I were on patrol in the most remote part of the Appalachian Range. It wasn't an easy day as we encountered hikers who needed assistance, discarded trash in pristine areas, and wildlife that seemed just a little too comfortable with humans. As night fell, we set up camp by a small river. It was a serene spot surrounded by impossibly tall trees. I started catching up with Silas about our families, ridiculing him for his newly acquired dad jokes since he became a father last month. It felt like everything was ordinary until we heard a rustling sound coming from behind us. We turned around just in time to see something slinking into the darkness. Must have been a raccoon, Silas shrugged. The thought of an impatient raccoon looking for food eased my tension because rangers are always alert for any potential danger. We continued talking about life when another noise caught our attention, this time coming from another direction. This sound was different. It was an unnatural mixture of shuffling, grunts, and some sort of clicking noise. Curiosity got the better of us so we grabbed our flashlights and traced the source of the noise through the dense forest. As we ventured further away from the comfort of our campfire, I couldn't shake off an inexplicable feeling of dread that only grew stronger with each step. Silently communicating through hand signals, as trained rangers would do, we finally found something disturbing. There lay several deer carcasses, all savagely shredded and strewn across what appeared to be a gruesome feeding ground. Silas whispered, Thistle morning, they were nowhere. What could have done this? I had no answer to that, but I couldn't shake off the creeping unease in the pit of my stomach. We decided to retreat back to the campfire, hoping that whatever monster had caused this carnage wouldn't catch wind of our small presence in the vast forest. It was past midnight now, and it was so cold that even the stars seemed to shiver. As we huddled around the dying embers of our fire, a haunting screech pierced through the silence. It felt as if it came straight from hell itself. Silas and I exchanged glances our faces filled with fear. Nothing we'd ever encountered sounded like that. The terrifying noise sent us into survival mode. We grabbed sticks, knives, or anything else to defend ourselves from whatever was stalking us. It was then that we heard heavy breathing behind us and braced ourselves for the inevitable confrontation. Suddenly, something lunged at us from the darkness— knocking me down in one swift motion. As I struggled to regain my footing, I saw the hideous creature under the piercing flashlight beam. Its mangled appearance was a sickening combination of human and animal features. In terror, Silas shouted for me to run as he stabbed at it with his knife, only grazing its skin deep. The creature screamed, an angry howl that shook me down to my bones. I grabbed Silas, and we bolted away from whatever nightmare had entered our reality. Adrenaline coursing through our bodies, we ran for what felt like hours until finally stumbling upon an old ranger's cabin hidden deep within the forest. We collapsed inside, panting and terrified out of our wits, knowing we would never be the same again after tonight. Hearing another gut-wrenching howl echoing through the distance, I look at Silas, and he looks back at me. Thus begins a long, sleepless night, knowing that the horrific creature is still out there, watching, waiting to strike again. 
As dawn broke, Silas and I barely got a wink of sleep. As soon as the sun rose high enough for us to feel somewhat safe, we decided to venture outside the musty ranger's cabin and try to make some sense of last night's events. Every rustle or creak made us jumpy, and it was evident that our nerves were frayed. It was a few hours before we stumbled upon a hidden entrance in the underbrush leading to a decrepit old house seemingly abandoned for years. The house seemed out of place in the dense forest, like an eerie relic from a time long gone. We cautiously approached and decided to see if there was any connection between this strange dwelling and the terrifying creature that attacked us last night. With our hearts pounding, we pushed open the rotting front door and stepped inside. The air was thick and musty, reeking of decay and something far more sinister. As we explored room by room, we came across journals and documents belonging to someone named Dr. Amos Rowland, a once-renowned scientist who was ostracized by his colleagues and disbarred from practicing due to his unethical experiments on human-animal hybrids. Our blood ran cold as we pieced together this disturbing puzzle, combining human DNA with animal genomes in an attempt to create unnatural abominations. What could have possessed such a man? The horrifying creature we encountered last night must have been one of his deranged experiments gone awry. We searched for more clues about Dr. Rowland's background and found that he had been driven mad with grief after losing his wife and daughter in a tragic accident decades ago. He believed that by unlocking the key to interspecies genetics— he could prolong human life beyond its natural boundaries, thus finding solace in his twisted thirst for immortality. But as the years passed and Dr. Rowland faded from public memory, so did his sanity. His hubris in playing God led to irreversible consequences, and the once brilliant scientist became an amalgamation of the very monsters he'd worked so diligently to create. It hit us like a ton of bricks. Dr. Roland himself must have been the repugnant creature we encountered the night before. We couldn't have been more horrified and disgusted by this grim realization. As we continued to explore, we heard a shatter from an adjacent room. We cautiously inched forward and froze in our tracks. It was Dr. Roland, or what remained of him, stuck between two worlds mangled flesh teetering between human and animal. Help me, he croaked, his voice nothing more than a dry rasp as he choked back bile and blood. Silas and I exchanged glances full of guilt, pity, and sheer terror. We didn't want him to suffer, nor could we leave such a lethal being loose in the wilderness. We decided that our mission was to destroy any surviving research before seeking help from authorities and disposing of Dr. Rowland in accordance with proper biohazard protocol. After hours of gathering evidence and destroying any trace of Rowland's horrific experiments in fire, we left the tormented scientist still alive but shackled securely enough for trained experts to deal with. As we made our way back toward civilization, there was little comfort in having survived this ordeal. A sense of dread lingered over our shoulders at all times, as if the unhallowed growls still echoed in our ears from the cold shadows of last night's horrifying chase. Silas looked at me and said quietly, The world should never know what happened here. I nodded solemnly agreeing that some things were best kept secret, for man's ambition had proven time and time again that evil lies within the depths where curious minds wander too far. Unlike other Saturdays, this one had a strange vibe in the air. I was hanging out with my friends, and we were all chilling at Crystalline Park, reminiscing about our teenage years. Truth be told, 
We were just a bunch of grown losers killing time and reliving old memories. As the afternoon drifted on, Jerry dropped an unexpected question that caught our attention. Hey, guys, do you remember that weird guy back in high school? The one they called Thorin Bleakborn? He snorted and threw a crumpled energy drink and into the nearest trash bin. I hadn't thought about Thorin in years. In retrospect, he had been an odd fellow. He always seemed to wear the same unassuming outfit every day, faded jeans and a plain black hoodie. I hadn't been close to him by any means, but I couldn't help feeling sorry for him when the others used to mock his peculiar mannerisms. We continued reminiscing about our high school years when suddenly Sam spoke up. Didn't his family own that creepy farmhouse on the outskirts of town? That memory sparked something deep inside of me. A gut instinct began to tingle in the pit of my stomach as our conversation led us to decide to visit Thorin's old farmhouse for our Saturday adventure. As we approached the rundown farmhouse under the rapidly darkening sky, I started feeling uneasy. This place loomed menacingly within an unnatural silence. Are you guys sure we should check this place out? I asked hesitantly. Anna, being the daring one among us, responded with a laugh. Come on. What's the worst that could happen? We're not kids anymore. Entering through the creaking front door, the musty smell greeted us first. The interior felt unwelcoming, as if it wanted us gone immediately. Cobwebs adorned every corner, with ragged furniture scattered across the buckling floorboards. We explored the house with a mix of excitement and trepidation. The damp atmosphere clung to my skin and made me shiver. Somehow, this place felt like it remembered what happened to Thorin all those years ago. Upstairs, we stumbled upon a room concealed behind a makeshift wall, an apparent hiding place. Inside was a life-sized portrait of Thorin's family, but something was off. The entire image was splattered with thick, dried red paint or something that looked like blood. Sam gulped as he studied the portrait. Dude, I just remembered. Wasn't there some story about his family disappearing one by one every few years? I heard that too, Jerry added, his eyes wide with fear. As we discussed the mysteries of the bleak-born family, I felt a sudden gust of frigid wind rush by and blow out the candles Anna was holding. The dark engulfed us as uneasiness crept in, making my heart race. I suddenly saw what looked like an ethereal figure, obscured yet humanoid, suddenly moving through the shadows on the outskirts of our vision. Startled, I took a few steps back and bumped into something solid and cold. Instantly, a guttural growl rumbled through the air around us, causing me to jump in shock. It sounded like nothing I'd ever heard before feral and sinister in ways that defied understanding or description. Frozen with terror, we stared at each other as an unspoken agreement formed between us. It was time to leave. In that suffocating darkness, we realized how badly we wanted to escape and leave the horrors of the bleak-born family farmhouse behind us. We stumbled over the dilapidated furniture, still coughing from the smell of mold and must that permeated our throats. Guys, let's just try to find an exit, I whispered, my trembling voice betraying my fear. The ghostly figure we had seen previously seemed to be a manifestation of Thorin Bleakborn himself. He appeared as a tall, gaunt man with disheveled hair and deep-set eyes, an eerie, decayed version of what he had looked like in high school. As we lurched through the house in search of an exit, we heard shuffling footsteps behind us. With my heart pounding in my chest, I glanced behind us and caught glimpses of the vengeful specter looming closer. 
Determined to uphold his malevolent legacy, Thorin would stop at nothing to destroy us all. We finally reached what appeared to be an old cellar door as another growl reverberated throughout the house. The iron handle was ice cold to the touch and pulled open with a deafening screech. Hurry up! shouted Jerry as he urged us into the darkness below. The cellar was colder than anything we could have ever imagined, a frigid tomb not meant for the living. As we descended its depths, we saw implements of torture strewn about, chains hanging from the ceiling, a blood-stained surgical table with horrible crimson stains on its rusted metal frame. It appeared that Thorin's family's disappearances weren't accidents. They were victims of this twisted place. What do you think happened here? whispered Sam, his gaze flitting across piles of decomposing bones haphazardly scattered across the floor like discarded playthings. The icy temperature and unyielding darkness burdened our souls. Thorin had deceived us all, luring us into his lair while disguised as a victim. Sickened and terrified, we fought back bile as we pushed ourselves to keep moving. Then, we stumbled upon a small tunnel at the far end of the cellar. Its walls were slimy, and its stench was noxious, but we knew it could be our only chance to escape the horrors of the bleak-born legacy. We took a deep breath and crawled into the tight space. As we traversed deeper into the eerie passage, a numbness set in, accompanied by a sense of hopelessness. Each agonizing step forward tested our will, reminding us that if we didn't emerge soon enough, it would assuredly be the end for all of us. We crawled for what felt like hours until, surprisingly, we saw light at the end of the tunnel. Hopes buoyed, we picked up our pace and stumbled into a cold winter morning just outside the farmhouse. The sunlight sparkled on freshly fallen snow. We stood there, shivering from both cold and exhaustion. The bleak-born family farmhouse overlooked us, an ominous testimony to once unthinkable horrors now irreversibly engraved in our minds. In complete silence, we left that place behind us. We returned to town and recounted our harrowing experience to the authorities, who listened with disbelief and mounting apprehension. And yet our tale was deemed too fantastic to be true. Explanations were sought elsewhere, wild animals or pranksters taking macabre advantage of local folklore. Our lives continued in seemingly normal conditions thereafter. Yet not one of us could shake those ghastly memories burning into our nightmares, nor Thorin's sinister essence looming over each passing day. But sometimes... When I find myself alone or in darkness too similar to that dread-infused night, I feel an icy grip around my heart, a perpetual reminder that the malevolent presence of Thorin Bleakborn, that unrelenting specter of fear and horror, remains entirely unconstrained. The first time I had the misfortune of meeting Sasha the Sadist, as I later nicknamed her, it was on a particularly grueling haul. As a long-haul truck driver, it wasn't unusual for me to encounter strange and sometimes unsettling characters on the road, but this one took the cake. I'd stopped in some remote area of Nevada for a quick bite and little did I know that this pit stop would change the course of my life. It was an unassuming evening, weather-wise. Clear skies and temperatures that were cool enough to require a light jacket but not so cold that you'd be shivering outside. The diner I went into was your typical small-town joint, the kind where locals consumed their daily dose of gossip along with their eggs and bacon. I'd just finished ordering myself some greasy food when Sasha walked in. Her entrance caught everyone's attention, not because she was astoundingly beautiful 
or obviously dangerous, but because there was something about her presence that made everyone momentarily stop what they were doing. Sasha took a seat at the bar, ordering herself a bourbon neat like it was some chore on her to-do list. She spoke assertively to the bartender, her voice strong and confident. The night went on uneventfully until I got up to settle my bill. Paying in cash, I nonchalantly tossed some tip money onto the counter near Sasha's drink. In my haste to leave, I knocked over her glass. Shit! Sorry about that. I stammered as Sasha narrowed her eyes at me. Sliding another folded bill towards her, I mumble an apology before hightailing it out of there as quickly as possible without outright sprinting. Hours later, down the desolate road, a set of headlights sped up in my rearview mirror. In real time, the realization came to me. It was Sasha, pursuing me with relentless determination. Her vehicle appeared to mimic mine a large semi-truck not too far off from the one I drove. I scrambled to call for help on the CB radio, pleading with anyone out there. A small voice crackled through the static. Someone had heard me. Before I could relay my location, Sasha's truck slammed into my trailer, sending a jolt of fear rippling through me. Her menacing figure appeared in the side mirror her eyes cold and unforgiving as she gestured with her knife-wielding hand for me to slow down. My breath hitched in my throat. Pulling over wasn't an option. I pumped on the gas harder than ever in my life, whipping around bends and barely keeping control as I attempted to evade my dangerous pursuer. Hope was replenished when a convoy of truckers responded to my distress call banding together to join forces against my relentless assaulter. Sasha seemed unfazed as she continued her assault despite being outnumbered. The windows of her truck had an ominous, bloodied message smeared across them. No mercy. I could only watch helplessly as she rammed one of the trucks in our convoy off the road before swearing into the radio that next time would be worse for each and every one of us who dared stand in her way. As she retreated, we exchanged tales of how each of us had somehow wronged this sadistic woman without ever realizing it. It occurred to me that it wasn't just about inconveniencing Sasha now. It was apparent that this deranged lunatic sought something much more sinister from us all. With every town we passed through and every gas station we stopped at, whispers circulated about more victims falling prey to Sasha the sadist. Yet each new detail added another layer of complexity and confusion. None of us could make sense of what connected these seemingly random acts of violence. After weeks of feeling paranoid and constantly checking over my shoulder, I finally decided that I had to do something about Sasha the sadist. If my trucker pals and I ever wanted to drive without fear again, we had to figure out who she was and why she was targeting us. I began to gather more information about the other truckers who had been tormented by Sasha. To my surprise, I found a pattern. In each case, the truckers had encountered her in dingy roadside bars and diners just like mine. We all seemingly committed a minor offense against her, spilling a drink or bumping into her, that inadvertently set her after us. As we continued to piece together more information, I noticed that many of Sasha's victims mentioned her wearing a unique tattoo on her arm. It depicted an intricate snake coiled around what appeared to be a broken steering wheel. It struck me as a possible lead. One afternoon, as I was stopping for fuel at a dusty truck stop just outside Reno, I noticed the unmistakable snake tattoo on the arm of a tired-looking woman behind the counter. Trying to remain calm, I decided this was my chance to gain some information about Sasha. Trying not to raise suspicion, 
I casually asked the woman about her tattoo. She hesitated for just a brief moment before telling me it was meant to honor her late sister, Veronica, who used to be a long-haul driver herself. Veronica died in a terrible accident caused by another trucker's carelessness. As she spoke of her sister's story, an old newspaper article came to mind. It detailed the gruesome accident where Veronica's truck burst into flames following the collision. When I pressed for more details, the woman revealed that Veronica had always been protective of their family growing up. Following her tragic death at the hands of another trucker, she swore revenge from beyond the grave on any driver who didn't show proper respect to the road and their fellow drivers. As I thanked her for sharing her story, the pieces fell into place. Sasha was Veronica's vengeful spirit, punishing truckers who had wronged her and her loved ones. Armed with this newfound knowledge, I gathered my trucker friends at our next stop. We vowed to spread the word about Sasha's origins, urging all truckers to be more mindful of their actions on the job. Little by little, stories of Sasha's attacks began to fade into memory. Truckers now tell tales of Veronica, the ghost with the snake tattoo on her arm, waiting to exact revenge for those disrespected or harmed by their careless colleagues. Life eventually started to regain some semblance of normalcy. Although we were still somewhat haunted by the memory of those terrifying nights, knowing the history behind Sasha's wrath helped ease our fears considerably. We moved forward into a new chapter in our lives as truckers, safer, more cautious, and always aware of the repercussions of reckless behavior behind the wheel. Occasionally, when I stopped at a desolate truck stop late at night, I could swear I saw Sasha's silhouette staring back at me from just beyond my headlight's reach. But perhaps that constant reminder of Veronica's spirit watching over us was what we needed to keep ourselves in check, a warning that we should always treat one another with respect on these long stretches of asphalt. In any case, it seemed our concerted effort to honor each other and pay tribute to Veronica had granted us a reprieve from Sasha's wrath, for now. But sometimes, deep down in those darkest hours on the road when all is quiet except for the rumble of my own engine in my ears, I can't help wondering if her retribution ever truly has an end. It all began on my 32nd birthday, when I decided to take a weekend trip to the Catskill Mountains with some friends. We rented a rustic cabin nestled in a dense forest that made for the perfect escape from the city. I had invited Tom, who was a seasoned skeptic, and Samantha, who loved cracking jokes. We were the perfect combination of personalities for an adventure. As we settled into the cabin, Tom couldn't resist poking fun at my decision to choose an isolated location for our get-together. I mean, think about it. What could possibly go wrong on a remote mountainside with no cell reception? It's almost like being in a low-budget suspense movie. Sam chimed in with a smirk. Or maybe it's just your hidden fear of experiencing anything beyond your precious gadgets. I laughed along, soaking up the banter and enjoying the change in pace. As darkness fell, we decided to light a bonfire and roast marshmallows. While huddled around the crackling pit, Tom alluded to some campfire tales he had heard about strange creatures supposedly prowling in the nearby woods. Sam dismissed them as folkloric nonsense immediately. Yeah, right, just some weirdos dressed up like Bigfoot trying to scare away tourists, she said sarcastically. The next day, we started on an adventurous hike through the scenic Catskill Trails. As we trekked, 
I suddenly realized how much I missed this sort of connection with nature. It was all too easy to get caught up in city life's hectic pace. Resting near a small creek, we greedily gulped water from our bottles and devoured snacks from our packs. Sunlight filtered through the green canopy overhead as our jovial conversation continued uninterrupted. As dusk started to settle in later that evening, we found ourselves nearing the end of our trek when we crossed paths with an elderly lady named Edna who lived nearby. She warned us about some odd occurrences in the area, and of course Tom and Sam brushed her off without hesitation. Feeling a little uneasy now, I decided to humor Edna and ask for more information. With genuine concern in her eyes, Edna explained that some locals had claimed to have seen terrifying creatures. She described them as lean, feral-looking beings, reminiscent of werewolves or dogmen from old stories but far more human-like. The mention of werewolves almost made Sam's eyeball roll off her head. Okay, sure, she said with mock sincerity. We'll be extra cautious. Edna nodded solemnly despite the obvious sarcasm and proceeded on her way. That night's bonfire was notably more subdued. Although Tom and Sam maintained their skepticism, Edna's words undeniably left a mark on me. Despite the uneasiness that had settled over us, we managed to finish our hike without further incident and returned to the cabin. Tom and Sam seemed more engrossed in their conversations, acting as if Edna's words had never left an impact, but I couldn't shake off the feeling of dread that her warning had left behind. I busied myself by preparing dinner for the three of us, trying to distract myself from the eerie feeling. On our final day in the Catskills, we spent the morning fishing by the creek. It was around 11.30 a.m. when I felt something watching me from a distance. The hairs on my neck stood upright as I glanced around at our surroundings. My eyes caught a glimpse of something almost human in appearance but twisted and grotesque standing near the edge of the woods. Its skin was a mottled grayish blue with patches of sparse hair on its arms and legs and long limbs that seemed to bend at unnatural angles protruded from its sinewy frame. It was humanoid but hunched over as if it had never learned to stand upright. Its face resembled both canine and human traits while appearing either at the same time. Wide, unblinking eyes peered out between distorted features. Sharp teeth were visible through a gruesome sneer. I stifled a scream catching my breath before I cautiously whispered to Tom and Sam, Guys, you need to see this. Their laughter ceased abruptly as they followed my gaze and discovered what I was looking at. Nobody dared move or make eye contact with this abomination. The creature shuddered briefly, releasing a horrible sound, something akin to a wailing sob peppered with guttural clicks before it disappeared back into the dense forest from whence it came. We clutched on to one another, unable to tear our eyes away from the spot where it vanished. With adrenaline surging through our veins, we quickly packed up our belongings and moved cautiously away from the creek. Nobody said a word. Our previous jovial tone had been replaced by a heavy silence. Earlier, I vaguely remembered Edna mentioning a ranger's station just a mile from the cabin. We agreed that we should seek help and report the incident there. The clock read 1.15 p.m. as we sped up the trail to the ranger's station, glancing behind us every few steps to make sure we weren't being pursued. Upon reaching the station, we explained our encounter to the ranger on duty in explicit detail. He listened solemnly, taking notes on our descriptions. I've heard stories of this creature, he said gravely, his face pale. We don't have an official name for it. It's something beyond our understanding. But it's been described by several other hikers over the years. 
Terrified, we pleaded with him to escort us back to the cabin so that we could grab our belongings and leave immediately. He agreed and accompanied us as we hastily collected our things. As the sun began to dip towards the horizon at around 7.45 p.m., we turned to leave the cabin behind with unshakable memories of our trip. The ranger informed us that they would be investigating further into our report before bidding us farewell. The three of us drove away in silence, unable to shake off our heavy hearts burdened by what we had seen in those woods, a grotesque nightmare come true. Even now, when I close my eyes at night, I can still see its haunting face staring back at me, a twisted and horrific image ingrained into my mind forevermore. But perhaps most disturbing of all is that even after days of searching and investigations done by the rangers after our incident was reported, no evidence of such a creature was found, nor was there any sign of where it may have gone. It remains a nightmarish enigma, a gruesome and terrifying mystery that haunts both the Catskill Mountains and our memories, lurking in the dark depths of the unknown. In the sweltering heat of July in southern Texas, I was making my daily commute home after another draining day at the insurance company where I worked. As usual, I was eager to reach my small apartment and unwind with a cold beer and some mindless television. Little did I know that an ordinary day would lead to an encounter that would change my life forever. My drive home took me through a lengthy stretch of lonely highway bordered on both sides by endless fields of tall cornstalks. The sunlight shimmered between the rows of plants as they whipped past my car window, painting my dashboard with irregular patterns. It was on this isolated road that I first spotted something unusual. As I rounded a bend, the brake lights of a car stopped just up ahead and caught my attention. Approaching closer, I could see the vehicle abandoned, its doors flung open, and the hazard lights flashing a silent warning. A thin line of black smoke curled out from under the hood and dissipated into the hot air. Concern for the driver's safety, or maybe just curious, I decided to pull over and see if there was anything I could do to help. I parked behind the vehicle and cautiously stepped out onto the gravel shoulder. As I approached the abandoned car, a sickening stench assailed my nostrils, a mixture of burning metal and something else, something rotten and indescribable. E.Y. Anyone here need help? I shouted into the surrounding field. There was no response save for the hushed rustling of wind through cornstalks. Before continuing further, I pulled out my phone intending to call for assistance, only to find there was no reception in this desolate area, which is precisely why it had been chosen as a dumping ground by someone or something with cruel intentions. My eyes were drawn to a trail of crimson stains leading away from the car and deeper into the cornfield, each one darker than the last, telling a story of struggle and despair. Uneasily, I followed the trail, fingering a small pocket knife in my jeans to give me a modicum of comfort. With each step, the sense of foreboding grew stronger, and the fetid odor thickened. I stumbled upon a gruesome sight in a small clearing, a lifeless body laid out on the dry soil, mangled beyond recognition. What could have inflicted such terrible wounds? Who was to blame for this grisly scene? As these questions swirled through my mind, a distant rustling from the cornfield intensified around me. Shadows glanced off the furrowed ground, revealing little of the terror that was quickly closing in. My heart raced as I tried to steady my trembling hands, weakness replaced by adrenaline-fueled determination. Who's there? 
I shouted into the darkness, my voice cracking with fear. But there was only stillness, as if nature herself held her breath in anticipation of what was to come. Sandwiched between horror and curiosity, I remained frozen in place, unable to move or think clearly. And then it emerged, an entity that defied logic or reason. Its towering form, silhouetted against the dying light, cast an oppressive shadow over me as it drew near with unnatural stealth. Its eyes burned like red-hot coals searing into mine as it inched closer, sniffing and clawing at its newfound prey. As I backed away from this monstrous creature, attempting to flee from my life, my trembling hand instinctively clamped tighter on the makeshift weapon I had grabbed in my panic, a rusty crowbar I found lying on the ground. Desperately, I swung it at the creature's head as it reached for me, making a last-ditch effort to fend off the beast. The skinwalker let out a gut-wrenching scream as the metal connected with its skull, staggering back from the blunt force. However, rather than retreating, the monster seemed more enraged. It let loose a blood-curdling screech and charged at me once again. My heart pounded in my chest as each step became a battle between hope and despair. Nevertheless, I managed to keep myself upright and began running away from the seemingly indestructible creature. As I sprinted through the darkened forest, the sounds of snapping branches and gnashing teeth echoed behind me. The chase seemed to go on for an eternity until an unexpected stroke of luck appeared before me, an old cabin that looked like it hadn't been inhabited for years. Praying that it would provide at least some temporary protection, I dashed inside and locked the door behind me. Exhausted but determined not to die without a fight, I frantically searched for anything that could help me fight this nightmarish beast. Thankfully, my efforts were rewarded when I found a double-barreled shotgun hanging above an ancient fireplace, along with a box of shells. I heard loud thumps outside as the skinwalker tried to break its way into what had become my fortress. My nerves frayed with each pounding sound, but my focus remained on loading the gun. Finally, as I chambered the last shell and hastily cocked both barrels, the door gave in under its brutal assault. The beast entered slowly, its maddening eyes fixated on mine as it drooled hungrily at my imminent demise. With no time to spare, I aimed and pulled both triggers simultaneously. The shotgun roared deafeningly, the force of the blast knocking me backward. The skinwalker staggered back as well, its body now peppered with pellets. It roared in agony but wasn't defeated yet. Anger and hatred burned in its eyes as it prepared for another attack. But before it could, a loud, booming voice rang out. Leave this place. The voice commanded, and to my amazement, the creature hesitated. Seizing the opportunity... I glanced past the creature and saw a man standing there, weathered by years of hardship but exuding an undeniable strength. I recognized him as Hank, a grizzled hunter who used to live nearby. Run! He shouted at me while lifting his own rifle to aim at the skinwalker. I didn't think twice. I sprinted out of the cabin and didn't stop until my lungs screamed for mercy. The next day, Hank showed up at my doorstep, one hand wrapped in bloody bandages. The skinwalker was gone, had escaped to places unknown, but not before Hank had managed to wound it gravely. He told me that such creatures should never be taken lightly, and that their ancient origins made them crafty and relentless. But as I looked into his eyes— those years of expertise now tainted with sorrow, a humbling sense of gratitude washed over me. This man had faced an unspeakable horror so that I might live to tell the tale. And though the monster may have eluded capture this time, thanks to our encounter with Hank, 
we now stand wiser and more equipped to tackle future threats. So today, we keep an eye out for sinister shadows lurking within the woods or whispers that speak of vengeful spirits stalking our steps. Because while the darkness remains unpredictable and frightening, it is only through facing our deepest fears that we learn how much strength truly resides within us. And in a world that appears increasingly haunting and full of terror, there has never been a more vital time to embrace the lessons of survival. There we were, just four officers sitting in the break room, joking around about the latest failed slice joint that had opened up nearby. Our taste buds were in desperate need of a caffeine fix, so we snuck out to grab a couple of coffees. It was March 23, 2008, a date none of us would ever forget. In hindsight, maybe our previous jokes were an ill omen. We brushed them off as just another rainy day in Tacoma, Washington. The conversation turned to that old abandoned factory on the outskirts of town. It had seen better days and had become an eyesore for the community. Some people took it upon themselves to spread rumors about that decrepit old place. And when it came to rumors, kids would act out their ghost-hunting fantasies, only adding fuel to the fire. As we walked back towards the station with our coffees in hand, Sergeant Tina Fields received a dispatch call to check out a possible disturbance at the factory. We all rolled our eyes and let out faint chuckles before volunteering as backup. We joked about teaching those wannabe ghost hunters a lesson. As soon as we entered that dark, dank building, something just didn't sit right. It smelled awful, like rotting meat left out for days, and there was no sign of those ghost hunters we'd been expecting. Instead, we found a pile of bones, animal bones, haphazardly scattered on the floor near what looked like nesting materials. That's when I heard it, a guttural yet strangely human growl coming from the darkness ahead. The unsettling noise made my skin crawl as I reluctantly stepped toward the source with my weapon drawn. State your name! I shouted into the abyss, hoping for an answer while simultaneously dreading what awaited me. No reply came, just another strange sound echoing through the hollow halls of the factory, somewhere between a snarl and a hiss. We continued forward navigating the maze-like structure filled with debris and rot. Abruptly, a figure emerged from the shadows at breakneck speed. It was inhumanly tall, with pale, stretched skin and rotted teeth bared in a chilling snarl. The creature's milky-white eyes fixed coldly on us as it lunged at Officer Ron Samuels with incredible force. His screams will forever haunt me, we fired frantically, bullets tearing through the creature's flesh but doing nothing to slow it down. In the midst of our struggle, Officer Jim Davis managed to pull Ron free from its grip before we all frantically decided to retreat. The monster simply stared us down as we retreated, its grotesque, twisted smile widening with each backward step. We stumbled blindly through the building, the sounds of ominous hisses and growls surrounding us, until we eventually burst into daylight. Forcing ourselves to focus on our injured comrade, we dialed for backup while trying to comprehend what had just unfolded before our eyes. Ron's injuries were severe, deep gouges cutting around his arm that required immediate medical attention. But in our terror and exhaustion, the story we told our colleagues sounded too absurd to be true. Most dismissed it as an exaggerated animal encounter, while others blamed it on hallucinations stemming from panic. Days later, after talking with an elderly neighbor who detailed sightings of a creature similar to ours dating back decades, 
we started questioning whether what we encountered was something more sinister than any animal attack or juvenile prank. We spent the next few days feeling paranoid, always looking over our shoulders, waiting for something else to happen. The incident weighed heavily on our minds, and sleep was nearly impossible. Tacoma no longer felt like home. One afternoon... While we sipped coffee at a nearby cafe, we couldn't help but overhear the conversation at a neighboring table, an elderly man regaling his young grandson with hushed stories of monsters and curses from his youth. You know, said the old man, there's this creature they call the Hollow. They say it was created years ago when a group of cultists came into town and summoned something they couldn't control. This thing... Whatever it is, has been living here ever since, hiding in abandoned buildings and preying on those unfortunate enough to cross its path. The description matched what we had encountered that fateful day, an unholy combination of animal and human, with eyes that seemed to peer straight through your soul. My friends and I exchanged uneasy glances as the old man continued. People say the cult was led by a man named Isaac Blackwood. He was obsessed with eternal life and wanted to create a being capable of granting him immortality. Somehow, though, judging by how the creature is still around, I'd guess he failed. For the remainder of our time at the cafe, we sat in silence as we pondered the implications of what we'd just learned. Had we stumbled upon some long-forgotten legacy left behind by Blackwood's twisted experiments? Was the hollow imbued with enough malevolence that it continued to haunt our city? Worried for Ron's safety, we decided to relocate him to a different hospital under a pseudonym in case the creature caught wind of his location. Later that same night, Word spread quickly through Tacoma's tight-knit community about an attack on Ron's former hospital room. Bloody claw marks covered the walls, but luckily, he wasn't there. I contacted a local detective, who, surprisingly, didn't dismiss my story outright. Instead, she admitted that she had been investigating a string of seemingly unrelated attacks and disappearances throughout Tacoma's history all bearing striking similarities to our encounter. She believed Isaac Blackwood had unleashed the hollow, and it had since grown beyond his control. As days turned into weeks, the attacks continued, each grisly incident a chilling reminder of the ruthless monster stalking our city. We'd always thought Tacoma was immune to this type of terror but now we realized it had been lurking beneath our noses for decades. The detective, a stern woman named Karen Price, kept us informed as best she could while also serving as a reminder never to speak about what we knew. The safety of Tacoma's residents depended on their ignorance. Not knowing what roamed the shadows was better than facing an all-consuming panic. One morning in the following weeks, I woke up to the life-shattering news that Detective Price had been found dead, her body mutilated by an all-too-familiar assailant. The attack felt personal. It was as if the hollow knew we were getting closer to uncovering its secrets and decided to retaliate. Heavy-hearted, my friends and I reached a silent agreement. The hollow wasn't going anywhere. As long as we remained in Tacoma... Its presence would linger like an ever-present shadow, a horrifying testament to Isaac Blackwood's failed quest for immortality. We gathered our ragged lives and relocated to separate corners of the country, hoping that whatever creature lurked in Tacoma's shadows would leave us alone if we stayed away. We told our family members that work opportunities had arisen or that love had courted us away from home. We never again spoke of what we'd seen that terrible day or why we truly left. Our lives are forever tainted with fear, our Tacoma memories poisoned by the visage of an ungodly creature that hunted us, a living embodiment of a twisted man's dark desire. 
But sometimes I hear the wind whisper Isaac Blackwood through the trees, and I know the hollow remains, lurking in Tacoma's shadows, a grim reminder of sins long past. My shift at Redwood National Park was coming to an end, and I was looking forward to wrapping up for the day. I'm Connor, a park ranger with several years of experience under my belt. This particular park in Northern California is beautiful but certainly has its fair share of danger. As I was making my rounds, I spotted something that made me stop in my tracks. There, just off the main hiking trail, lay a lifeless deer with its entrails splattered around it in a chaotic scene. Colorful jokes slipped from my repertoire when faced with this gruesome mess. The brutal carnage looked as if it had been violently shredded apart, leaving nothing but a disfigured heap of flesh and bone. I radioed for backup and continued examining the grisly scene while waiting for my colleagues to arrive. Nearby trees bore deep gashes and were smeared with blood and shreds of fur. It was apparent that whatever did this was both vicious and efficient. The distant sound of crunching leaves caught my attention, and as I turned towards it, I noticed an eerie chill in the air. Moments later, my fellow rangers arrived, their expressions grim as they surveyed the ruthlessly dismembered deer corpse. We decided that we needed to find out what could have caused such mayhem within our park boundaries. We postulated possible predators, a rogue bear or perhaps even a mountain lion. But deep down, we all knew that neither one of those animals would carry out such a savage and unnatural attack. Over time, we encountered more mutilated carcasses on our patrol prompting us to alert both local authorities and park visitors about the unsolved series of incidents taking place within the preserve. Rangers changed their shifts so that two people worked together at all times. Nobody wanted to be alone out there with such an unpredictable threat running rampant. Finally, one evening after dusk, while patrolling alongside my colleague Emma, we came face to face with the fiend responsible for the terrors within our park. Standing amidst towering redwoods was a monstrosity that towered over ten feet tall, covered in dark matted hair, and exuding a putrid, sour stench. It lumbered towards us as though it had no concern about being discovered or confronted. Emma and I knew at once that this creature violated the expectations of any animal we had ever encountered. The air around us grew colder and more oppressive. Its malicious stare bore into our souls. We struggled to contain our surging adrenaline as we drew our weapons. We couldn't allow this monster to wreak more havoc on our beloved park or harm anyone living nearby. Our shots thundered through the damp night air, puncturing the unnatural creature's massive frame with each well-placed discharge. It fell backwards, bellowing an earth-shaking baritone of pain and anger as it collapsed into the darkness. Our hands trembled with anticipation for what would come next. Just then, shrieking from deep within the underbrush erupted, and a pack of monstrous figures burst forth, their twisted faces and gnarled limbs a twisted mockery of nature. Smoke billowed from their gaping maws as they launched themselves at us with unbridled fury. We realized then that the first creature we had encountered was just the beginning of a much larger, more sinister force. As bullets sped towards our twisted foes, their bodies contorted unnaturally dodging every shot with unnatural reflexes. Our newfound terror was palpable. We were being toyed with. As we struggled to reestablish our aim, the monstrous figures closed in on us, showering us with a haze of thick, choking smoke. On the edge of utter desperation, someone from our group had an idea, 
These creatures were born of some dark magic or unnatural force. In desperation, they pulled out a small vial they had been given months before by a mysterious old lady who claimed it contained powerful protective energies. Everybody gather around, they yelled. We need to pour this stuff on each other and hope it protects us from their evil influence. We huddled together, frantically splashing the liquid over our heads and onto each other's shaking limbs as the creatures advanced upon us. Just as the first creature reached out to strike us with its gnarled fingers, something extraordinary happened. A brilliant light flooded our vision as though some divine power protected us and poured over us. Shock gasps emitted from our group while relief washed over us like rainwater. The creatures howled a harrowing screech and recoiled in fear as we witnessed them being pushed back by this unexpected force. The darkness retreated farther into the shadows while the creatures writhed in pain. They clawed at their faces as their forms turned black and charred, as if burned away by potent sunlight. Once the paranormal disturbance appeared to subside, we sprang around afterward in shock at what had just transpired before us. How could these nightmarish abominations have taken residence under our very noses? And what did it mean for the future of this town? As we picked ourselves up and dusted ourselves off, the group exchanged cautious glances. We decided to keep this event a little secret, at least until we knew exactly what we were dealing with. On the way back to town, we came across the old lady on a small, deserted road. She smiled enigmatically seemingly all-knowing of the horrors we had just faced. The creatures that harass you tonight are a testament to something dark and ancient buried deep beneath our town's soil. She explained in a low, raspy voice as she fiddled with the beads on her bracelet. This is hardly over. A long battle against evil is about to begin. We stared at her in apprehension each member of our group aware that this newfound responsibility was far from something light and simple. The knowledge that our once peaceful town harbored these malevolent beings threatened to consume us and fueled a newfound determination. Then teach us, I implored, echoing my friend's sentiments. Show us how to protect our town and rid it of whatever darkness is attached to it. We will said the old woman. But beware, once you know their nature, there's no going back. And so, with trepidation, we embarked on a perilous journey through the secrets of an ancient darkness that haunted our home, one that left us not only questioning everything we thought we knew but delving into a hidden world of perilous rivalry between forces both good and evil. But as the months turned into years and further unspeakable events unfolded around us, sparking whispered tales of terror among townsfolk, it became clear that generations to come would bear witness to our ongoing struggle against the nightmares that emerged from beneath our streets. I was always the type of guy who could find humor in even the darkest of situations. So, when I landed a job as a night watchman at a wind farm in Arizona, I figured it wouldn't be so bad. After all, how scary could it be to watch giant windmills spin majestically under the night sky? It wasn't until the mutilated cows showed up that I started having second thoughts about my career choice. It was mid-October when a rancher friend of mine stumbled across the first victim. The Arizona weather hadn't quite reached its chilling winter stages yet, but there was a faint bite to the air. As shocking as it was to hear him describe the animal's mangled carcass, part of me couldn't help but crack a few lifeless bovine jokes. Knowing I'd be spending my nights out there on the farm didn't stop me from bonding over morbid humor, especially with my friend. 
I continued my patrols each night as usual. As unnerving as the idea was, I chalked up the cow's gruesome fate to some predator attack or macabre prank. Things remained relatively calm for about three weeks until one cold November evening rolled around. My shift had started just like any other, no signs of strange behavior or cause for alarm. When midnight struck, though, everything changed. From the distance, I noticed an eerie fog settling over the wind farm, its tendrils snaking around each massive turbine like something from a horror film. Curiosity drew me out of my patrol station and toward where the fog persisted thickest, turbine number 13. As I approached, an unsettling realization dawned on me. This wasn't any ordinary fog. It instead reeked of gasoline fumes and tasted acidic on my tongue. Feeling uneasy, I decided to head back to my patrol car and radio for help. That's when I spotted him, a tall, lanky figure shrouded in darkness. His clothing was tattered and smelled like a mixture of rotten meat and charred flesh. Bound to his wrists were crude lengths of chain attached to blood-stained hooks. Muffling my panic and remembering my high school football days, I tried to tackle the abomination. Maybe I could pin it down or stun it long enough for backup to arrive. But just as fast as I glimpsed him, a massive, muscular hand swatted me through the air, crumpling me against the ground painfully. Nursing a bruised rib or two and struggling to draw breath, I hoped he would bash my skull into mush and end my suffering then and there. But as I gasped for air in the cold night, the figure slipped back into obscurity, his chains rattling with ominous echoes. It didn't take long for sirens to puncture the night's silence, accompanied by flashes of blue and red lights illuminating the farm. A cacophony of voices filled my ears while paramedics fussed over my battered state. What happened? A local cop asked, his expression teetering between bewilderment and concern. Between painful breaths, I spilled out an account of what took place and by the look on his face, I knew he believed me. Days turned into weeks after that incident. The story spread like wildfire around our little rural community. Theories were spun about who or what hunted at our wind farm, meth heads with bloodlust or an unfathomable creature claiming territory near our sleepy town. My wounds have been healing steadily since then. But everyone knew better than to ask if I wanted back on night shift patrol. We all understood my time had come to stay clear of that wind farm altogether. With preparations made for another watchman's replacement for those cursed nights, in an attempt to understand more about the creature that nearly killed me, I decided to visit a local historian with a keen interest in cryptids and legends. I figured she might have heard about something similar to this horrifying entity. After we exchanged pleasantries, I recounted my harrowing experience in great detail, from the gruesome cow discovery to the vile fog reeking of gasoline, and finally my attack. Her eyes widened as I described the figure with chains bound to its wrists, hanging with blood-stained hooks. She shuffled through her large collection of books and papers until her hand stopped at a worn, old leather-bound tome titled, Myths and Monsters of the Southwest. Flipping through the pages, she pointed at a chilling illustration of a fiendish creature with grotesque features. This is it, she whispered. This is your attacker, Havikorin. Havikorn was a monstrous entity believed to dwell in desolate wind farms, thriving on chaos and darkness. Its origins were unknown, but numerous accounts throughout history told tales of Havikorn's spine-chilling appearance and its propensity for sudden violent attacks. I took mental notes as the historian elaborated on Havikorn's possible motives 
ranging from territorial disputes to twisted games it engaged in with humans who intruded on its domain. Determined not to let this monstrosity continue haunting our town's wind farm and endangering more lives, I formed a plan to search for Havocorn with a group of volunteers from our community. Guns would be useless against such an entity. Instead, we would be armed with sturdy steel rods to fend Havocorn off whenever possible. At dusk, we gathered near the wind farm entrance, everyone tense yet resolute. We made our way between turbines, holding flashlights in one hand and steel rods in the other, while scanning our surroundings vigilantly for any sign of the creature. Hours passed without any incidents, making us wonder if Havocorn had moved on or was simply uninterested in our intrusion. As the night wore on, a thick fog began rolling in, eerily similar to that fateful night when I encountered Havocorn. We stood back to back, forming a tight circle as we nervously gripped our weapons. The night air became heavy with dread as chains rattled ominously in the distance, accompanied by the guttural snarling of a creature hidden within the darkness. Suddenly, one of the volunteers felt a massive hand grasp his shoulder with bone-crushing force. Before he could react, he was thrown several yards away from our circle, skidding painfully across the gravel-strewn ground. Panic spread through our group as Havocorn emerged from the fog like an ancient specter, its monstrous visage haunting our worst nightmares. Realizing we were outmatched, I shouted for everyone to disperse and head for safety. With hearts pounding in terror, we scattered into different directions, attempting to escape Havocorn's wrath while praying that we would all survive and reunite again. Two days later, Exactly half of our volunteer group was still unaccounted for. We could only hope they had managed to distance themselves from Havocorin's domain and were alive somewhere out there. As for me, I cringed while recalling Havocorin's face as it sneered at us before disappearing back into the fog, its presence forever casting an ominous shadow over the wind farm. Now that we knew more about Havocorin's existence and potential motives, strengthening security measures around the wind farm became crucial, whether it meant erecting barriers or enlisting more skilled night watchmen armed with new information about this terrifying menace. Still nursing my emotional scars and physical bruises from my two encounters with Havocorin, I couldn't shake off the feeling that my battle with the monstrous entity was far from over. The lingering thoughts sent shivers down my spine. Would anyone, myself included, ever truly be safe from Havocorin's wrath? Only time would tell, as our small town confronted its new reality and pondered the day when Havocorin might strike again. As I walked through the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota on that fateful August afternoon in 1997, I felt an eerie sensation wash over me. It was as if the air had grown colder and thicker, making it harder to breathe. But I brushed it off as paranoia and continued my patrol through the deserted area. My name is Nimkiai Kaskaskia a proud Oglala Lakota man who has lived on this reservation for the entirety of his life. I've been working as a security officer for a few years now, responsible for keeping an eye out for any misdeeds that might be committed by or against our community members. It's a responsibility I take seriously. One of the elders in our community, Akachita Mato, warned me about something stalking people around here lately. Stories had been spreading like wildfire about an abnormally large and vicious creature terrorizing anyone who strayed too far into the isolated areas of the reservation. What's it supposed to be? I had asked Akachita while we shared a cigarette in front of his house one day. 
Cascade to H. Albacata, he replied, the Alpha Dogman. According to him, this beast wasn't your run-of-the-mill werewolf myth. Rather, it was something far more sinister and deadly. A massive, humanoid canine predator said to be far more aggressive and cunning than the creatures we'd heard whispered about in campfire tales. I couldn't help but scoff at the idea of such an entity existing on the reservation and shook my head dismissively. But Akachita's stern gaze made me rethink how lightly I was taking it. There was genuine fear in his eyes, something rare for the hardened old man. As I patrolled the perimeter of the reservation that day and recalled our conversation, my logical mind still couldn't entertain the possibility of such a horrific myth actually being true. But as I entered a particularly dense wooded area, the atmosphere shifted. The air fell nearly silent, and the only sound that accompanied me was the soft crunch of dead leaves and twigs beneath my boots. That uncomfortable feeling of being watched returned, making the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. My pulse raced as I glanced around, attempting to find any sign of what had set off my heightened senses. And then I heard it, a guttural growl that wafted through the trees, shaking me to my core. It sounded as though it came from a massive throat, and it was close, far too close for comfort. As I paused and strained to see through the dense foliage around me, adrenaline coursing through my veins, a figure emerged into view. The monstrosity was at least ten feet tall, with signingly mottled gray fur covering its grotesque body. Its muscular arms ended in razor-sharp claws, capable of tearing flesh from bone with ease. But what terrified me most were its eyes, cold, malevolent orbs that bore into mine with an unsettling level of intelligence. Time seemed to slow as I struggled to form any coherent thoughts or plans at that moment. The beast snarled again and then lunged forward with unnatural speed. I instinctively stepped back as the beast raced towards me, trying to avoid its powerful claws. My heart pounded fiercely in my chest, and I knew I needed a plan if I wanted any chance of surviving this encounter with the Alpha Dogman. As it closed in, I quickly surveyed my surroundings and noticed a thick branch nearby. With great effort I rolled towards it, narrowly dodging the creature's grasp. Snatching up the heavy branch, I instantly felt more capable of protecting myself. I faced the beast again, desperately searching for any sign of weakness. The creature leered at me with malicious intent. Its horrible features were becoming clear, its elongated snout with saliva dripping onto the ground, its disheveled and bloodied fur resembling that of an ancient beast that had barely survived hellish conditions. Its movements were fluid and predatory. The silence was broken by a sudden, high-pitched screech as someone else joined the fray. A young woman emerged from behind a tree, holding a flare gun and aiming it at the alpha dogman. Hey! she yelled, holding her position confidently. Leave him alone! She fired the flare straight at the monster's face. It yelped and staggered back as red sparks flared around it. I glanced over at the woman between breaths and managed to say, Thanks. Who are you? My name's Nita Brave. She replied as she rushed over to help me fend off the creature. Akachita asked me to follow you. He said you wouldn't believe him about this thing. The Alpha Dogman came at us again, but was visibly disoriented from pain and confusion. We took this opportunity to attack together. The next few minutes were a blur of adrenaline-fueled action. Nita repeatedly fired flares to further injure the creature while I lunged with my makeshift weapon whenever I spotted an opening, trying to inflict as much damage as possible. The beast was relentless, but so were we. Several agonizing moments later, 
the Alpha Dogmen appeared weakened, more vulnerable than before. We were drenched in sweat and covered in dirt and scratches. Nita fired one final flare that hit a nearby tree, causing it to collapse onto the wounded beast. The creature howled in pain but was unable to free itself from the weight of the fallen tree. Nita and I exchanged a look of understanding. We didn't want to kill it, so we chose to leave the alpha dogman writhing helplessly, trapped under that tree. Nita offered me a hand, and we both left the scene with a sense of accomplishment. We had faced the terror that haunted Pine Ridge Reservation and managed to live to tell our story. Word spread quickly among our community members about our encounter with the Alpha Dogman. It was decreed that no one should venture into its territory again for fear that it would seek revenge on those who had wounded it. As we prepared for another day's patrol, Nita came up beside me. Made it out alive, she grinned. Yeah, I replied, eyeing our flimsy gear. But just barely. We shared a knowing nod before starting our rounds. Those dark woods never ceased giving me chills, tainted by the memory of the carnivorous beasts lurking somewhere in their depths. Our community survived under this shadow, never losing ourselves to its horrors but always remembering that much evil lives alongside us in this world, an eerie truth far too real for comfort. My day started like any other, with me casually sipping my first coffee and reminiscing about a hilarious party I had attended last weekend. My name is Kensington Vanderbleek, and no one would ever imagine what fate awaited me on that fateful day. On the surface, my life was composed of ordinary routines and simple pleasures, but little did I know that soon it would be turned upside down. My friend Aloysius Goodfellow had invited a bunch of us for lunch at this secluded cabin he had recently inherited. I wasn't particularly close to him, but we shared mutual acquaintances who always spoke well of him. Aloysius seemed like someone with a good head on his shoulders. Upon arriving at the cabin, an unsettling feeling began to creep into my consciousness. It wasn't anything about Aloysius or his cooking that tickled my nagging gut instinct. It was something quite intangible. As we sat down to eat our cheeseburgers with an emulsion of exotic spices, after all, Aloysius was known for his culinary inventiveness. Our conversation gradually turned to the unsettling rumors surrounding the nearby forest. Some tales claimed that hikers had gone missing without a trace, while others suggested there might be some kind of creature lurking within the shadows, preying on innocent women engaged in mundane activities like fetching water. During our juicy gossip session, we heard a noise outside akin to twigs breaking underfoot. An ominous sensation surged through me, driving all other thoughts from my mind. Instinctively protective, Aloysius instructed us to remain behind and ventured outside armed with a flashlight and a hefty-looking shovel to investigate. Moments later, horrified screams pierced the night, propelling us out of our perceived safety to aid our besieged friend. The scene we stumbled upon was pure horror. Aloysius lay beneath a looming figure with sunken eyes and cloven feet staining the ground crimson. The creature, adorned in tattered clothes, hurriedly retreated into the forest as we lunged toward it with makeshift weapons. We didn't dare venture into the forest, having already witnessed firsthand the carnage this creature was capable of. Aloysius, though still breathing, was in terrible condition. His injuries were severe enough to warrant an immediate trip to the hospital. En route, he managed to gulp out a delirious utterance. Vargas! Never knew it was real! Several days later, 
after sniffing through local records and tales shared amongst Barstow sommeliers. I pieced together my own suppositions around this Bargus. The word Bargus refers to a legendary monstrous black dog from northern England said to possess a sinister bite. Rumors and whispers distorted the truth about the creature's origins until, by all likelihood, it could have been any malevolent fauna hunting or searching for prey on this cursed land. It's been several weeks since that day. Though Aloysius is slowly on the mend, it frightens me to know something so vicious lurks just beyond our unknown boundaries. The pitch darkness outside doesn't feel inviting anymore. Its once mesmerizing allure has been replaced by paranoia about what could be concealed within its bounds. Everyone at that cabin has gone their separate ways since that horrifying evening, and whatever happened to that savage demon remains a mystery. I often find myself wondering if the Bargast is watching from afar, those sunken, hollow eyes fixated upon its next hapless victim. As days turned into weeks, I became obsessed with deciphering its motives— terrified that someday it could be me or those I love marked for a hideous fate. Overwhelmed by my growing obsession, I began to think more strategically. I started connecting dots that might not have seemed immediately relevant but were worth investigating nonetheless. Upon recalling how Aloysius mentioned the creature as Vargas, a chain of events led me to believe there was a higher likelihood of encountering this creature if I joined some group hiking trips around the forest's most notorious spots. Simultaneously, I borrowed books from the local library, devoured online articles, and interviewed anyone who claimed prior knowledge of the creature. One morning, just two days after Aloysius' chilling encounter— I met a hiker named Alan who had overheard my conversation about the Bargast at a local café. Alan seemed like an ordinary fellow, perhaps a bit rough around the edges, but he invited me to join him on his next hike to a remote area known as Blackmore Ridge, a place he claimed the Bargast had been spotted recently. We embarked on our trek early in the morning to maximize daylight hours and lessen the probabilities of facing this formidable foe under cover of darkness. As we advanced along uneven terrain beneath towering trees obscuring the daylight above, I couldn't help but feel vulnerable and exposed. Alan, sensing my apprehension, clapped me on the back and handed me an antique hunting knife he had inherited from his grandfather. Though not an upgraded modern weapon by any means, it felt comforting to have something with which I could defend myself. When we arrived atop Blackmore Ridge early in the afternoon, we found signs of what appeared to be a struggle or recent disturbance. Several areas of torn turf revealed claw marks gouged deep into the earth. Nearby lay scraps of torn clothing that seemed oddly familiar yet difficult to place. Feeling numb with terror, we discussed whether our plan would unfold carefully enough for us to confront this monster without becoming its next prey. Alan remained silent for several minutes before whispering, Do you remember how Aloysius described the creature? Those sunken eyes, cloven feet. Suddenly, something clicked in my brain piecing together several seemingly unrelated incidents leading up to our hike, I realized how much of a fool we had been for not noticing sooner. The events that led us here, the mysterious creature sightings, Aloysius' gruesome encounter, and even our acquaintance with Alan, had all been meticulously orchestrated to lure us right into the beast's lair. In that instant of epiphany, a chilling laugh echoed through the trees. I felt a gut-wrenching terror overcome me as I stared into Alan's shifting visage. His sunken eyes and sardonic grin grew darker as rows of razor-sharp teeth emerged from his distorted maw. Then it hit me. Bargus! 
It seemed I'd found precisely what I'd been searching for, but I hadn't anticipated such horrifying closeness. In one fluid motion, I pulled out the antique knife and lunged at him with every ounce of strength left in my trembling body. The creature that was once Alan let out an unearthly shriek and retreated into the depths of the forest before disappearing completely. The creature's blood traced my knife's blade, still dripping menacingly onto the matted ground. I dashed blindly through the trees until exhaustion forced a crash landing near a small country road. As I stumbled along dirt paths and murky pathways guided only by adrenaline-fueled survival instincts, my thoughts fumbled between what we had just discovered and what could happen next. Two days later, after avoiding sleep and human contact for those staggering forty-eight hours, I resumed my search for answers. The ancient hunting knife still haunted my dreams. Its origin story remained shrouded in mystery, as if its previous owners held a secret link to this creature's existence. Not a single shred of evidence could pin down the creature, its history, or its potential return. Forever now, I will live in constant dread that my reckless pursuit may have sealed fate not just for myself but also for those closest to me. I wish I'd left the mystery of the Bargus alone. I'd always been a proud Native American, working as a park ranger in Grand Teton National Park. One day, while enjoying some downtime with co-workers during a late-night dinner break, we laughed about our newfound love for bear spray and its never-ending supply. It was a joke that only we could understand, given our line of work. As our laughter died down, I suddenly noticed something strange about the crisp night air. Growing up in the area and experiencing all sorts of wildlife encounters had given me a sharp intuition about these things. I shrugged it off assuming it was just coyotes or raccoons searching for food. A week later, several hikers reported an unusual animal sighting near one of the isolated trails. The descriptions varied wildly among the witnesses. Some described it as a large wolf or bear-like creature standing on its hind legs, while others were convinced it was a grotesque hybrid of the two. Some visitors even left the park in fear, opting for more populated locations away from whatever this unknown creature was. It seemed like an urban legend gone awry, at least until one day, when my skepticism was tested in ways I couldn't have imagined. While patrolling one evening, I saw what looked like claw marks on several trees along my usual route. They were deep and jagged, unlike anything I'd seen before. Even my co-worker Paul, who had been a park ranger for over twenty years, seemed uneasy about their origins. As we ventured further into the woods to investigate the claw marks, Paul and I stumbled upon a massive paw print pressed into the soft ground between some tree roots. The sheer size and weight of whatever was created were unlike anything native to this region. We continued forward cautiously and found remnants of unspeakable violence. Torn clothes soaked in blood clung to broken branches nearby. A dismembered hand lay not far from the spot, grasping at nothing. The gruesome scene in front of us was unlike anything we'd ever witnessed. Before my brain could even process what I was seeing, a chilling growl echoed from behind us. It was a deep, guttural snarl that sent shivers down my spine. The sound soon became more frequent, letting us know that the creature was approaching. Having no time to react, Paul and I sprinted back through the woods, desperate to escape whatever animal or thing had done this. The creature following us seemed part wolf and part bear, yet we knew deep down that it was nothing that could be easily classified. As we ran for what felt like hours, 
it remained right on our heels, seemingly toying with us in some twisted game of cat and mouse. The sounds of its paws and what sounded like laughter left us both paralyzed with fear. Suddenly, as we burst into a small clearing, the creature leaped out in front of us. We skidded to a stop just inches from its blood-stained form. Our eyes locked onto one another's. Its soulless black eyes bore into mine as if it could read every thought in my head. I remembered the bear's spray and blindly aimed, hoping to get a shot off before the creature devoured us whole. With every ounce of strength in my trembling body, I sprayed the bear spray in the general direction of the creature. It screeched, an ear-piercing sound that was unmistakably painful, and stumbled back. Seizing the opportunity, Paul and I dashed towards the park entrance, desperate to get help if we managed to survive. Breathless and terrified, we made it to the entrance and collapsed into each other's arms. Paul managed to dial 911 before he, too, passed out from sheer exhaustion. The police arrived shortly after, and upon hearing our story, they immediately secured the area and called in a larger task force specializing in dangerous animal behavior. They conducted a thorough search of the woods for any sign of the creature. In their search, they stumbled upon the remnants of an old shack hidden deep within the woods, which seemed to have been recently inhabited. Inside were shelves filled with books about genetic engineering and animal modification. Among them was one that caught their attention. My Life's Work, Combining Species, written by Dr. Lennox Greer. Dr. Lennox Greer had been a highly acclaimed geneticist before his license was revoked due to unethical experiments on animals. He had since faded into obscurity, but seemed to have kept up his horrific work despite numerous regulations and warnings. It all started making sense. Dr. Greer had created this creature using his twisted knowledge of genetics, combining elements from different animals such as bears and wolves into one monstrous being. The disturbing guide revealed how he utilized stolen scientific equipment to further complicate his creation's nature, even boasting about successfully releasing his most successful hybrid into the wild. Days later, what remained of Dr. Greer's creation was found clinging to life near a ravine deep within the woods. The specialist task force sedated it before transporting it to a high-security enclosure where its future would be determined. The news shook the entire community, and countless headlines questioned how someone like Greer had managed to operate under the radar for so long. The local government vowed to conduct a thorough investigation into the matter and further tighten the regulations and inspections. As for Paul and me, we both took some time off work to recover from our harrowing experience. We attended regular therapy sessions and finally managed to find solace in knowing we weren't delusional, that the creature was no urban legend but a byproduct of a twisted individual's pursuit of science without ethics. To this day, I still get shivers when I think about our encounter with Dr. Greer's creation. But as time goes on, I try to remind myself that it wasn't the creature's fault. It was the result of one man's hubris and utter disregard for the sanctity of life. I've since returned to my duties as a park ranger, but every crackle in the woods or rustle in the leaves sends my heart racing, wondering if another beast is lurking in the shadows. I know that no matter how logical and brave I am while on duty, there will always be an unnerving reminder of what can happen when humanity tries to play God and ultimately fails. Growing up as a Native American, I have always heard about the terrifying creatures my ancestors feared. 
It was my uncle who first shared the chilling tale after an unusual incident he experienced one day at his workplace. My uncle is an electrician, and he had been hired to do some repairs at an old cultural center in Denver, Colorado. He had been working for hours, and the sun had set outside while he was still busy fixing the electrical systems of the center. The atmosphere grew darker inside, but he barely noticed due to his complete focus on the task at hand. As he reached an old storage room in the back of the building, he opened the door to find a musty odor lingering in the air. Suddenly, he heard a blood-curdling scream coming from somewhere within the center. He dropped his tools in a panic and sprinted towards the noise, skidding to a stop at a junction of corridors that led to different parts of the building. At that moment, he caught sight of something horrifying. A grotesque creature with long limbs covered in dark fur glared at him from across one of the usually well-lit hallways. The ghastly figure's eyes were black like endless voids, and its fearsome jaw drooped open over sharp fangs glistening with saliva. My uncle stared back, his heart pounding wildly in his chest as his mind raced through possible explanations for what was happening. The stress must be getting to me. He muttered under his breath before cautiously approaching the menacing figure. As they circled each other warily, it became clear that there was more going on here than just a simple hallucination brought on by stress or fatigue. This creature seemed real, solid even, and its eyes appeared to be blazing with unholy rage or hunger. My uncle felt cornered since his only weapon was his wit, which had helped him survive numerous difficult situations before this one. He tried cracking a joke, hoping to lighten the tense atmosphere. Looks like someone forgot their Halloween mask early, he said, nervously laughing at his own words. The creature only growled menacingly in response, sending chills down my uncle's spine. His arms broke into goosebumps as he struggled to come up with a solution. That's when it dawned on him. The stories passed down from his ancestors about this malevolent being were somewhat similar. In the face of this deadly situation, my uncle knew that standing still and doing nothing would achieve nothing, so he had no choice but to try and confront the creature head-on. He paused for a second before lunging towards it with courage beyond understanding. As my uncle lunged toward the creature, he grabbed a nearby chair to use as a makeshift weapon. Swinging it desperately, he managed to land a few blows on the menacing figure. But instead of retreating, the creature only seemed to grow angrier, snarling and lashing out with its razor-sharp claws. My uncle knew that he was no match for this nightmarish being. As the terrifying battle continued, it became evident that my uncle couldn't keep up the fight much longer. Sweat dripped from his brow, and every breath was a painful struggle. With each passing second, his strength waned further. Just as my uncle's energy was nearly spent, the front door burst open and two police officers rushed into the room, their guns drawn. They had received an earlier call about disturbing noises coming from the house. Seeing my uncle and the creature locked in combat, they immediately opened fire on the monstrous being. The bullets tore through its dark flesh, causing it to howl in pain. Despite its injuries, however, the creature put up a ferocious fight lurching toward the officers with deadly intent. The officers continued to shoot until their guns clicked empty. As the wounded creature lay sprawling on the floor, it slowly started to take human form again. My uncle looked at its mangled, bleeding body in horror as he registered that this monstrous being had once been a man named David Lewis, someone he barely knew as an ordinary neighbor. An officer approached my uncle and quickly explained that they had been investigating David for weeks now, 
ever since several mutilated corpses were found throughout town bearing marks of fiendish violence. The horrifying acts were committed in secret, while David transformed into something beyond human, influenced by ancient black magic rituals fueled by pure malice. Thanks to my uncle's quick thinking and courageous confrontation with David in his monstrous form, more people were saved from falling victim to his bloodlust. However, the sinister reality of what David had been and what he was capable of actively lingered in my uncle's mind. My uncle could not shake the notion that someone else in the shadows might one day continue with the dark rituals David performed and beget more horrendous creatures posing as unsuspecting humans. As days turned into weeks, my uncle remained on edge. While he was glad that David was no longer a threat, it became clear that as long as secrets lurked behind closed doors and within people's minds, nobody would truly be safe. What had begun in the depths of darkness would continue to silently fester like an eternal curse, just waiting to strike. Feeling uneasy with every passing day, my uncle couldn't sleep without checking the locks twice or watching for unnatural movements in the shadows. He'd become wary of strangers and found himself scrutinizing everyone he encountered, wondering who might be harboring a similar darkness within themselves. Through this harrowing experience, my uncle realized that there are always hidden unknowns in life, and accepting them is sometimes the only way to stay sane. Though he tried not to dwell on it, he resolved to always remain vigilant, for what you don't know can often be scarier than what you do. I had always been a fan of puzzles, especially the ones that took time and patience to solve. Growing up in the small town of Emerald Hills, there wasn't much else to do for entertainment, unless you counted tossing rocks into the river or watching paint dry. So when I found an old map rolled up inside the walls of my family's farmhouse, I knew I had stumbled upon something special. The following Tuesday, I was grabbing a coffee at the local cafe when my good friend Armin Ivory came stumbling in. He always had a knack for arriving at the worst possible moment, but he still managed to be charming. Hey, Levant, he said breathlessly. You didn't tell me about discovering a secret underground hideout. Not so loud, Armin, I hissed back. I didn't want everyone to find out about it before we could investigate. That night, Armin and I met up just outside town to explore our strange new discovery. Beneath an unusually large boulder lay an entrance to a hidden tunnel that seemed too perfect to be natural. It was eerily silent as we descended deeper into the dark depths below. We encountered a horrifying sight as soon as we entered the hidden chamber. Rows and rows of skeletons clinging to the walls with chains so tightly wound that it was clear they had endured great suffering. The air hung heavy with death and sorrow. What the hell is this place? Armin whispered, visibly shaken. He was no stranger to gruesome crime scenes due to his work on the police force, but this felt different. It looks like we might have stumbled upon some sort of hidden prison or torture chamber, I replied somberly. Suddenly, we heard scrambling from further down the corridor. Gripping our flashlights tightly and not knowing what else to do, we cautiously approached the source of the noise. As we rounded the corner, we saw her, a girl no older than sixteen, lying on the floor. Her sobs echoed through the chamber. She looked up as we approached, weariness and terror in her eyes. My name is Sparrow Evergreen. She croaked, struggling to get out the words between her sobs. How did you end up here? I asked gently, trying to soothe her fears. 
I don't know, she whispered. There was a man, tall, broad, wearing a mask that covered his whole face. Before I knew it, he grabbed me off the street and brought me down here. Armin and I exchanged worried glances. This was bad. Not only had we uncovered a horrific secret location, but now there was a kidnapper on our hands. As we helped Sparrow to her feet, something fell from her pocket. Picking it up, I realized it was a necklace with an intricate pendant. Inspecting it closer, I noticed that it was identical to the design etched on the walls of the chamber. What is this? Armin asked suspiciously. Sparrow snatched it from my hand defensively. It's my mother's, she said quietly. She gave it to me before she disappeared. My heart tightened in my chest at her confession. A sickening sense of dread began to build as we realized we were finally unearthing a town secret that had been buried for too long. And just like that, the walls seemed to close in around us. From somewhere deep within the darkness of those tunnels, something malevolent stirred. The moment I heard Sparrow's story, I knew we needed to do something. Armin and I helped her out of the dreadful chamber and back to the surface. We guided her safely back to the town and made a promise to bring her mother's kidnapper to justice. Over the next few days, we conducted in-death research on the kidnapper, a tall man with broad shoulders wearing a mask that covered his face. It looked like our antagonist had been skillfully abducting innocent people throughout the years leaving no trace behind. He was meticulous and resourceful, making it impossible for the police or any of his victims' families to find him. While gathering more information about this man, we decided it was best if Sparrow stayed with us. This way, we could keep an eye on her safety. During one late-night conversation between Armin and me, he mentioned how certain elements in Sparrow's story didn't entirely line up, and it left a lingering doubt in his mind. Curiosity got the better of me, and I decided to take a closer look at her mother's pendant, the one resembling the symbols etched on the walls of the underground chamber. To my horror, upon further inspection, I discovered that those very symbols connected her directly to our masked kidnapper. I couldn't understand how such an innocent young girl could be related to such a sinister figure. However, my gut told me it wasn't safe or wise for Sparrow to stay with us any longer. Armin and I confronted her at breakfast the following day. Sparrow, I began hesitantly. We found something disturbing about your mother's pendant. Sparrow glanced at me nervously and clutched the piece of jewelry tightly around her neck. After a few minutes of tense silence, she finally broke down in tears. My father, she sobbed. He was a monster. My mother tried to protect me from him and his evil actions, but I found out eventually— I was trying to hide the truth. Although our instincts demanded that we distance ourselves from her, Sparrow's pleas for help struck a chord in our hearts. We decided to work together in order to confront her horrific past. The four of us, Armin, Sparrow, her mother, and I, prepared for the inevitable showdown. We gathered all the weapons we could find that would hurt a person or an animal guns, knives, and even a bat. The last thing we wanted was to resort to violence, but in this situation, we had no choice. We ventured back into the underground chamber one more time. This time, however, Sparrow led the way. Her determination reflected in every step she took towards confronting the antagonist of her life. As we delved deeper into the catacombs beneath our town, we found a dimly lit room where we met our gruesome adversary. He stood towering at six feet, five inches, 
while wearing a mask made of human flesh sewn together with a sickening grin plastered across its face. That's when an intense battle erupted between us and this deranged villain. Amidst the chaos of bloodshed and heart-pounding adrenaline surges, Sparrow fought bravely for her life and that of others who had been tormented throughout the years by her father's twisted games. In the end, though battered and bruised, we emerged victorious despite sustaining several injuries ourselves. To our dismay, however, Sparrow's father managed to escape death once again. His cunning and intuition proved too great even in his vanquished state. Frustrated but alive, we returned topside carrying both hope and a chilling, lingering sense of unfinished business. In the weeks following our harrowing encounter with this depraved man-man of unspeakable horrors, whom even his daughter feared, the town slowly began to heal. Although the masked kidnapper was still at large, we promised to remain vigilant. We would relentlessly pursue him until his conscience consumed him, or our perseverance paid off, with him finally facing the consequences of his despicable actions. As time trickled by, Armin and I remained inseparable allies, bonded by our unwavering dedication to bring peace and justice to the town of Emerald Hills. I couldn't shake the feeling that my favorite childhood treehouse was watching me. Every time I glance over at it from my bedroom window, that nagging sensation in the back of my mind would only grow more persistent. Now, you may think I'm letting a child's memory influence me, but I assure you, things didn't used to be this way. The treehouse had always been my sanctuary, my escape from reality until about a week ago, when everything changed. My name is Chayton Whitewater, and I come from a long line of Sioux Native Americans. As you can already guess, I grew up surrounded by our tribe's culture and traditions, which were lovingly passed down to me from one generation to another. Even though times have changed and some rituals are no longer relevant in today's society, they still hold a special place in my heart. Our small town is nestled in a region abundant with natural beauty, including vast forests and breathtaking lakes. Sitting idly along the shores of Lake Winnewanka, our community has always been tight-knit and supportive. We never used to worry about stepping out after dark or venturing into the forest alone. That is, until recently, when strange occurrences started piling up. It started with stories circulating among friends about odd noises at night or mysterious tracks left behind on their properties. Even I noticed scratches on trees near my home, unlike any animal marks I've ever seen before. These incidents turned into more alarming matters, such as livestock found dead or mutilated and pets suddenly going missing. One evening, while making dinner in the kitchen and listening to our old radio for some entertainment, I heard something outside that sounded completely unnatural, like a howl mixed with an eerie screech. Unsure if it came from an animal or maybe just interference from the radio, curiosity got the better of me, and before I knew it, all logical reasoning flew out of the window as I ventured outdoors with a flashlight. Following the source of the sound, I walked towards the forest, my heart pounding in my chest. While shining the light between trees and bushes, my eyes caught a glimpse of something I could barely comprehend. A monstrous creature that resembled a distorted amalgamation of several beings, its grotesque features overtaking anything else in the shadows. The moment I realized what was before me, that thing vanished back into the darkness from where it came. My sleepless nights have become endless since that troubling encounter. Time dragged on, and more eerie incidents kept happening, 
which only further confirmed my suspicions that we were indeed dealing with something horrid, an abomination born from the darkest secrets of our land's rich history. The days blurred together, and the threat of this unknown entity was always present. Locals and neighbors began securing their homes tightly and going out in groups to tackle their daily tasks. Safety in numbers seemed like the best strategy for now. A strange turn of events occurred when Nazan Goldman, an elder within our community, shared a story about our tribe's ancestors facing similar threats many generations ago. According to our legends, these tales described a sinister beast known as Wakandaji, a mixture of an owl and a bear created by dark forces that were summoned to lead victims to their deaths. Our once serene town has changed completely ever since Wakandaji arose from the pages of history. We're all afraid now and living on the edge, unsure when it will resurface or what terrors it might bring along with it. I came to the realization that I needed help, and a group of like-minded locals decided to band together and face this terrifying creature. We called ourselves the Lake Watchers, each of us having had our own unnerving encounters with the beasts now settled in our town. We all agreed that if we were going to take any action against it, we needed to do our research. Gathering tips from ancestors who dealt with similar threats and spending long days in the local library taught us that brute force wouldn't work on the creature. Instead, we had to outsmart it. We learned that Wakandaji was a cunning predator, using its appearance and eerie noises to lure victims away from their homes before attacking. We wished to study its behavior from a distance, so we set up hidden cameras around the forest's edge, where several sightings had been reported. Based on past incidents, we suspected it would come for us one by one in an attempt to eliminate each threat, except there was one condition— it had never faced a coordinated group armed with knowledge about its weaknesses. There were several other findings from our investigations that confirmed previous stories of this twisted fusion between an owl and a bear. With mismatched limbs and a disturbingly elongated neck, prowling through the shadows at night had become its forte. The shrill cries it emitted were bone-chilling enough to send shivers down my spine. Worst of all, though, were those five distinct claw marks found at the scene near my childhood treehouse. They were only added proof that Wakandaji killed without remorse. Fighting this malevolent force wasn't going to be easy. We started preparing by setting up bait around town in strategic locations while everyone worked together to gather necessary supplies such as protective clothing and weapons capable of harming an animal-like creature. Assorted knives, hunting rifles, and reinforced slingshots, we armed ourselves with anything we thought could give us an edge against the foe. Finally, after long days of preparation and anticipation, the fateful night of our confrontation against Wakandaji came. The evening air was heavy with tension as the lake watchers gathered together. We waited until we captured movement from our hidden cameras before bursting into action. With adrenaline surging through our veins as we raced towards where the creature was last seen, we knew this was our chance to put an end to its reign of terror. A cacophony of inhuman screams filled the night sky as we zeroed in on Wakandaji's location. This time, however, it wasn't going to be the hunter. We had turned the tables on it. As a group, we continued to approach it from various directions, flanked by our fellow townspeople armed with firearms and blades. Arms raised and weapons at the ready, the beast knew that it was outnumbered. Cornered and desperate to escape, Wakandaji screeched with pain as our weapons hit their mark and tore into its monstrous flesh. Its body trembled in agony as it backed away towards a nearby cliff edge to avoid our relentless attacks. Gravely injured yet still undefeated, 
Wakandaji slipped over the side of a cliff and down into the icy depths below. Never before had our community felt such relief upon waking up to the following morning's sunrise. News of what occurred spread like wildfire. Local families emerged from their homes to offer tearful gratitude for what we'd done. The death toll from this long-standing nightmare was finally beginning to recede. As for me, there was something cathartic about standing beneath that treehouse again after all these years, knowing that I'd played a part in restoring peace to my once troubled town. Though still haunted by my chilling encounters with Wakandaji, I stood outside my window gazing at that same old treehouse, no longer plagued by fear. Yet there remained an unsettling question whispered among the townsfolk. Was Wakandaji truly gone, or was our fight against darkness still far from over? Whatever the truth may be, I knew we had proven that unity and determination were enough to drive away the night's terrors, at least for now. It was my tenth day of training at the Ranger Academy in Big Bend National Park, a place known for its expansive canyons, vast deserts, and complex ecosystems. I was feeling confident but still had moments of uncertainty, the perfect mix needed to elicit my full potential. My parents were with me that day, supportive as always. They had treated me to lunch at the park's local diner, which turned out to be an unforgettable experience. A local woodworker stopped by our table to perform, spoon chewing, an odd traditional performance I'd never heard of before. He slowly bit through a wooden spoon with his teeth, which made the most unsettling sound. Fast forward three weeks. I had just been assigned to a missing person case near the Blue Ridge Forest Service Station in Virginia. The situation was fairly standard. Hikers taking a shortcut through an off-limits area reported what seemed to be human remains near a cave deep within Devil's Gorge. I reached the cave entrance and descended into the gloom. My partner, who chose to remain behind due to a severe leg injury, maintained radio contact with me. During our descent into the pitch-black cave, our conversation switched from recalling stories about unusual customs we discovered on our adventures to eerie mysteries that piqued our curiosity. Did you ever come across that legend about the boogeyman while growing up? My partner inquired suddenly. I think so. Wasn't it about some shapeshifter that stalks children in their nightmares? I replied, not entirely sure why he brought it up. In the darkness below, I discovered several carcasses that appeared deliberately mutilated by something with considerable strength. Their spines were severed entirely, leaving them twisted and grotesque-looking. Strangely enough, there were no signs of blood or struggle around them. It was as though they'd been placed there deliberately. As we continued discussing eerie stories and sharing laughs, I suddenly felt a cold breeze on my neck. I turned to find the cave opening slightly smaller than before, barely wide enough for me to fit through. Lost in thought, I bumped into something hanging from the ceiling. It was a dark figure that slowly swayed with a guttural growl. It lunged at me and vanished just as quickly into the shadows. My heart was pounding in my chest as I tried to calm down, but the fear had already taken hold. I took a few cautious steps when I heard a loud crash behind me. The figure re-emerged from the shadows with a fervor that left me feeling exposed and vulnerable. My breathing intensified as I attempted to assess the situation while simultaneously trying to fight off overwhelming terror. At that moment, panic took over. My vision filled with darkness. It was as if cold, wet fingers were grasping for me from every angle, 
like in those nightmares where you're powerless and feel something sinister lurking just beyond sight. As the horrifying apparition approached closer, I readied my firearm, frightened but prepared to protect myself against this mysterious creature. A guttural growl crawled up my spine before my partner called out through clenched teeth. Stay back. Don't call its attention. Little did we know that it was merely the beginning of an ongoing conflict with something ancient and elusive that lurked within the depths of the Blue Ridge Forest. As our days in the forest turned into nights, we couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. My partner's leg injury was only getting worse, but he insisted on staying with me, even though it meant enduring the unrelenting dread that weighed heavily upon us. We decided to ask around about anything strange happening in the area. During our search, we came across a park ranger named Dan who had encountered something in the woods. He said that it was unlike any animal he'd ever seen and that his fellow rangers never believed him when he spoke about it. Throughout his career, he'd discovered gruesome scenes where other rangers, or sometimes even their entire families, had been violently slain as if by a vengeful force. One ordinary morning, we were startled awake by gunshots outside of our makeshift campsite. I grabbed my rifle and rushed out to find Dan standing over a mutilated body, his expression one of horror mixed with steely determination. I finally found it. He whispered, This is exactly what killed those rangers and their families. He pointed toward a figure disappearing into the trees, an odd blending of humanoid features and animalistic terror. Its massive size made trees sway as it retreated deeper into the dense foliage. From then on, everything became a blur of frenzied desperation to find this being before it could inflict any more havoc upon the unsuspecting community. The human elements that once brought levity to our investigation now hang like oppressive shadows. Another day passed with no new leads. My partner's condition deteriorated further as the infection set in, leaving him delirious and barely conscious. Fearing for his well-being and desperate for answers, I carried him out of the forest until we stumbled upon a small village not far from where we had begun our investigation weeks earlier. I left my friend at a doctor's house with strict instructions to keep him safe while I headed back into the forest determined to confront our tormentor once and for all. As I trudged back into the heart of darkness, crushing exhaustion fought with urgency. It was only when I came face to face with the creature again, surrounded by the shattered remains of our campsite, that my heart seemed to stop altogether. Who are you? I asked, my voice barely a whisper amid the dense forest silence. A gut-wrenching laugh erupted from the creature just before it lurched closer. My fingers tightened around the trigger as its raspy voice hissed out a response. My name is Devon. The name seemed so absurdly human that my resolve wavered. A sudden gust of wind revealed decomposition consuming part of Devon's face, a jarring contrast to its remaining human features. But as I stared into its hollow gaze, I sensed something like sadness intertwined with an insatiable desire for vengeance on those who'd crossed it. I lowered my rifle but held my ground. Why? I demanded. The creature sneered, spit dripping from its decaying lips. Because they never believed me. Devon answered before limping away to melt once more into the shadows leaving only echoes in its wake. I stood alone in the crushing silence of Devil's Gorge, unable to comprehend what had just transpired. Wordlessly, I returned to the village where my partner was being treated. We left as soon as he could walk again and never spoke about that final confrontation or our regrets surrounding it. Months later, 
news arrived that Dan had been found dead in an eerily similar fashion to his previous discoveries. Unexplained brutality mixed with cold, deliberate precision. My partner and I exchanged glances, grasping for words that refused to surface and questions we knew could never be answered. And so we left the mystery of Devon, the tormentor of the Blue Ridge Forest, buried within the shadows, refusing to acknowledge our gnawing suspicions, a silence interrupted only by that horrible laughter echoing in my dreams and forever haunting me with its unspeakable, unanswered terror. It was the echo of laughter coming from the dense woods surrounding Bateson Park that first caught my attention. I had been tasked with cutting down trees as part of the U.S. Forest Service's efforts to clear away dead wood and overgrowth. The park, located on the outskirts of Illinois, was a vast terrain filled with lush greenery and several winding creeks. No one would ever expect anything sinister to lurk around here. My name is Levon Staghorn. I've never been a fan of my name, but I'm a fan of what I do. In the 30-plus years of my career, the woods have always been my place to unwind and leave behind the stresses of daily life. A wife and two rebellious teenagers will do that to you. Watch out for that tree stump, Levon! We wouldn't want our star player on crutches before game night. Rourke Chaston kept me on my toes almost as much as he kept the laughter alive at work. On weekends, we gathered for poker nights where the stakes were low, but the stories were always high. A short time later, as we continued our day's work, I noticed an odd silence in the area where the laughter had echoed earlier. Not wanting to bring it up and seem paranoid or incapable of focusing on our tasks at hand, I shoved it off as nothing important and got back to work. As days turned to evenings, chatter amongst me and the boys revolved around their experiences on previous assignments or reminiscing about family vacations and backyard barbecues. Nobody mentioned any odd encounters or peculiar sightings in this particular park. One day, while working near a creek, everything changed. Rourke had wandered off towards some bushes when I heard him let out a sharp yell followed by unsettling silence. Anxiously, I ran towards him, only to find him frozen in fear, staring in terror at something just out of sight. Rourke! What's going on? I tried to cut through his rigidity with my words, but to no avail. Nudging him slightly to the side, I caught sight of his terror, a corpse in an advanced state of decomposition. Visible bite marks covered its skin, which were surprisingly large and irregular. It seemed as if the victim had been mauled viciously before being left to rot among the underbrush. Trying to console Rourke, I convinced him that we needed to call the police and report this gruesome discovery. After answering their questions and providing all possible details about the body, we returned to work, only able to imagine what horrors must have befallen that unfortunate soul. Not long after that, several Forest Service workers shared their experiences regarding unusual sounds and sightings in some secluded areas within Bateson Park. They worried it might be a mountain lion or a pack of dangerous coyotes encroaching upon these lands, endangering both park visitors and workers. In an effort to understand what was happening out there and for our own sanity and safety, a few of us started researching local animal attacks and recently missing people. We soon stumbled across accounts of a grizzly predator that was not native to Illinois but had somehow found its way into our territory. During one intense late-night session at our local library, yes, we still believed in actual research, we came across a rare manuscript that documented obscure folklore from surrounding regions. 
Our hearts dropped as we stared into a sketch of a creature viciously attacking an unsuspecting human with teeth bared wide enough to make any seasoned woodsman quiver in fear. Scrolling through our memories, trying to put together pieces that made any sense, chills ran down our spines at that glaring image where the creature was referred to as the writhing beast a voracious predator and a constant threat lurking from deep within. We were convinced this monster was responsible for the death earlier on, and potentially other deaths in the park. The growing unease we felt was no longer in our imagination, but right there for all to see. Paranoia had settled into our minds permanently, as we could no longer enjoy our time within the ever-dwindling serenity of Bateson Park. Meanwhile, the echoes of laughter continued to haunt us from the shadows, as if mocking our feeble attempts to unravel this enigmatic predator. As days turned into weeks and months since our initial findings, reports of similar bodies covered in those large, irregular bite marks grew alarmingly high. Waking up the next day, I felt a renewed sense of determination. I decided to take matters into my own hands and find a way to stop this living beast. Even though I had my reservations, it became apparent that the proper authorities weren't taking the threat seriously. Word got around quickly, and soon some of the other park workers joined me in my quest. Our main issue was figuring out where the beast was hiding during daylight hours. We spent days combing through every inch of Bateson Park, searching for any signs or tracks we could find. On Wednesday morning, around 7.30 a.m., near the creek where we had found the first body, we stumbled upon something astounding. A hidden cavern obscured by dense foliage led us down to a dark, damp underground chamber. The air was rife with the stench of decay, and as our eyes adjusted to the dim light, we saw it, multiple carcasses in various states of mutilation. It was evident that we had discovered the beast's lair. Carefully, we surveyed the area for any evidence of its presence or whereabouts but found nothing concrete. As we mulled over our next move, a grim realization dawned upon us. If we wanted to catch this creature once and for all, we needed to prepare for an all-out confrontation. We secured several hunting rifles from a nearby gun store under the guise of dealing with a mountain lion threat. While none of us were particularly proficient in their use, there simply wasn't any time for proper training. We also stocked up on emergency medical supplies and notified some trusted family members about our plan, just in case things went awry. At 4.45 p.m. on Friday evening, we stationed ourselves near the entrance to the cavern, waiting patiently for our quarry to emerge under the cover of darkness. With every passing moment, the tension mounted as anxiety turned to dread and then absolute terror. Hours later, as the clock struck midnight, the hair on our necks stood on end as a guttural growl echoed through the trees. The writhing beast appeared from the shadows, its sallow skin stretched taut over exposed sinew and muscle. Towering at nearly eight feet tall, it moved with an unnatural fluidity that would make anyone's skin crawl. As the creature charged, it let loose a blood-curdling scream that split the silence of the night. We fired our rifles with shaky hands and pounding hearts a chorus of gunshots echoing throughout Bateson Park. Impossibly, this monstrosity seemed unfazed by our attempts to bring it down. One jagged-toothed swipe of its enormous claw left Rourke on the ground, clutching his stomach as blood pulled around him. Leave on! Run! Get out of here! He screamed as his body convulsed in pain. Wounded but not defeated, I managed to unload another round on the beast. The writhing beast stumbled and then fled back into its cavern, seemingly injured by our continued barrage. 
seeing my friend in such agonizing pain and well aware that we were severely outmatched, I made a choice that still haunts me. We needed to retreat. My comrades and I carried Rourke's trembling body back to civilization, where we obtained medical help for him. In those few moments that we left the gruesome scene behind, something within me began to shift at an unfathomable level. Investigations into the bizarre nature of these events soon took place in earnest after our ordeal that fateful night at Bateson Park. We found solace in knowing that this time the authorities took our evidence and eyewitness accounts seriously. Now a hardened and changed man, I cannot escape what happened in those dark woods just over a week ago. While none dared return to eliminate the threat once and for all, the writhing beast's reign of terror seemed diminished, perhaps out of fear or even injury beyond comprehension. Miraculously, Rourke survived his devastating encounter. Even though life has somewhat resumed its usual course, I cannot shake the lingering sensation that the creature remains lurking in the shadows, waiting for its next prey. It's a haunting reminder that some monsters defy explanation and are best left undiscovered. My day started off like any other. I was polishing my boots and sipping my black coffee, mentally preparing for another day of covert operations, when my buddy Rick cracked a joke about how we were like an old married couple, forever bickering about who left the damn door open. I chuckled and shook my head, not knowing what lay ahead of us. As a special ops agent for the government, I thought I had seen it all. But nothing could prepare me for the terror that would unfold later that evening. On routine patrol in a remote area of the United States, a dense forest nestled between two mountain ranges, our mission was to assess potential threats from an increasingly hostile rebel group that was rumored to be hiding in this region. Hours into our trek, we came upon an achingly brutal sight. Three deer torn to pieces, entrails strewn about as if arranged by a twisted artist. The violence inflicted on these animals suggested it must have been something far more powerful and terrifying than just a pack of wolves. The air hung heavy with dread as we continued on, remaining vigilant after encountering such carnage. That's when we first heard it, a distant howling unlike anything I had ever heard before. It sent shivers through my entire body. We remained on high alert, expecting the worst from this ominous creature. Our encounters began almost playfully at first, distant glimpses of something terrifying yet intriguing. A flash of piercing eyes disappeared as quickly as they appeared, leaving us unnerved but also more curious than scared. But as the days passed, our fear began to outweigh our curiosity. The creatures started to come closer, leaving behind gutted animal corpses too grotesque to describe, their innards draped from trees like grotesque ornaments. Our orders were clear, observe and report back any suspicious activity related to the rebel group we were tracking. There were no instructions on dealing with monstrous creatures lurking in the shadows or how to cope with the growing sense of dread that consumed us. We began huddling closer and closer together, our weapons almost always at the ready. Late one night, whispers erupted that maybe we were dealing with one of the entities from folklore, being so terrifying that they were shrouded in myth. Suddenly, it became harder to shake our suspicions about what or with whom we were dealing with each passing day. Then, on a treacherous cliffside, as we continued our mission, it showed itself. The horrifying beast stood nearly eight feet tall, with yellow eyes and a humanoid figure covered in coarse hair. Its teeth were sharp and stained red from fresh blood. 
Rick screamed out in terror but was quickly silenced by its primal roar. It leapt toward us with unimaginable speed, savagely tearing into my team members as if they were nothing more than paper dolls. Their screams echoed through the dense forest as I tried to buy time for myself and the few others who remained. In a desperate attempt to draw it away from the terrified survivors, I fired my weapon until I had no bullets left. But whatever this unholy monster was made of, it seemed impervious to our assault rifles. Now entirely outmatched and surrounded by devastating loss, there was only one choice, to dive off the cliff into the turbulent river below. As I did so, Barely clinging to life on a jagged rock amongst the churning waters in a last-ditch effort for survival, the sheer force of the water landing disoriented me, but I managed to cling desperately onto the jagged rock. The raging river rushed around me as I prayed for my life. Above, I saw the beast pacing back and forth along the cliff's edge, its furious eyes burning through me. My surviving comrades stared down in horror, helpless to do anything. I mustered my last ounce of strength and began climbing onto a larger rock. Collapsing on it, I saw that my team was providing cover fire against the monster, buying time for my escape. Drenched and shivering, I swam with the current towards an injured comrade a few meters away. Alex, though badly injured from our struggle with the creature, was alive. Alex! I gasped as I reached him, blood seeping from his wounds. Charlie, it's you. He coughed miserably. We need to get out of here. I told him as we clung to each other in the rapid waters. We floated downstream until we found a small clearing by the river bank. Struggling our way out of the relentless water and collapsing onto land, our battered bodies trembled from more than just the cold. As night fell and we tried to tend to our wounds, Alex began recounting a local tale he'd heard in town about an ancient curse placed on a nearby burial ground. It was said that whenever blood spilled upon it, this monstrous guardian would awaken and seek vengeance on whoever dared violate its sacred grounds. We didn't realize our mission had inadvertently brought us too close, attracting this hellish protector's wrath. For days, we hid during daylight hours and traveled under moonlight, evading not only this creature but also any signs of guerrilla forces nearby. As our injuries took their toll and fatigue drained us of strength, we stumbled upon an aging shaman living in a secluded hut deeper within the forest. Begging for his help, we hesitantly told him about our encounter. In exchange for our promise to leave and never return, he provided a strange teleportation-like method of securing our passage out of its territory. The shaman prepared an elaborate ritual, drawing symbols on the ground while chanting in a forgotten tongue. As night fell and shadows grew long, a circle of light opened before us like a portal. Our nerves frayed, but the glimmering hope of escaping both the beast and this volatile region fortified our resolve. Alex and I braced ourselves, watching as the beast crept near its haunting eyes glowing with vengeance. Waiting for the opportune moment, we lunged into the bright circle before it closed over us in an instant. The sensation was unlike anything I had ever experienced. My body felt weightless and stretched like a million strands of string pulled simultaneously. When we landed, we found ourselves on the outskirts of a small village, far from the reach of the monster that hunted us. Alex and I, weakened by our injuries, were soon discovered by bewildered villagers who took us in. They had no knowledge of this ancient lore. To them, it was just another story passed down through generations. Eventually, word reached our superiors about our predicament, and they sent a rescue team to retrieve us. We bid farewell to the grateful villagers and boarded our helicopter— 
aware that we were leaving behind a deadly secret nestled within these dense forests. As Alex and I reflected on our harrowing journey back home, we knew that some horrors should never be meddled with or revealed to those not entwined with such darkness. This horrifying beast's existence would remain here, locked away in these desolate woods where fate had brought us face to face with it one terrifying afternoon. Little did we know at that time that we would forever carry its sinister memory within our souls, a chilling reminder of the darkness lurking within even the most ordinary places. Working the night shift in special operations was never dull, but tonight felt eerier than most. As Tom put on his gear in preparation for the mission, he couldn't help but notice how unusually quiet it was. The only sound that could be heard was the distant laughter of one of his colleagues, a sharp, refreshing jolt amidst the seemingly never-ending silence. Located in an undisclosed facility somewhere in Arizona, Tom's unit was assigned to deal with clandestine operations too dangerous and odd for regular military personnel to handle. The mission tonight involved infiltrating an abandoned compound that once housed a secret laboratory, long rumored by locals to be haunted. Of course, Tom and his team didn't buy into such superstitions. They were trained professionals who dealt with reality. Little did they know that what awaited them was far beyond their wildest imaginations. Once they arrived at the compound, Tom scoped out its perimeter while the rest of his team prepared for the infiltration. The night air was oppressive and suffocating, almost as if every breath he took coated his lungs with a thick layer of dust and decades-old decay, an unsettling feeling he tried to push from his mind. As they entered the forsaken building, it quickly became apparent that something wasn't right. The walls were adorned with sinister symbols and dried bloodstains, and the halls echoed with an almost tangible sense of malevolence, not what one would expect from a former government facility. Tom's radio crackled to life as one of his team members nervously reported finding several mangled bodies in a nearby room. The mere description sent shivers down their spines. These corpses weren't just dead. They were massacred beyond recognition. Faint whispers and unidentifiable sounds plagued their every step as they cautiously proceeded through the twisted labyrinth that made up this forsaken structure. The deeper they ventured into the compound, the more disturbing their surroundings became. A series of rooms contained the remnants of unspeakable experiments involving both animals and human subjects. Whatever transpired in this dark place was not only horrifying but also inhumane. Navigating through the halls, Tom grew increasingly uneasy and could feel his heart racing with anticipation of what lay ahead. They soon found themselves in a vast, central chamber obscured in darkness, perhaps the heart of the operation. The air was thick with a sickly sweet scent that made Tom's stomach churn. Before they could even process their disgusting surroundings, a guttural, nightmarish shriek pierced the air. Suddenly, something monstrous lunged toward them from the shadows, something tall and twisted with elongated limbs that moved with unnatural speed and agility. As Tom fought against this horrific attacker, his mind raced to identify what it could be. It was undoubtedly some sort of creature born from sinister experimentation or an entity mutated beyond human comprehension. Injured and exhausted, Tom managed to escape its clutches long enough for his team to regroup and assess their situation. They discovered that bullets had no effect on the creature. It simply laughed off their attempts to bring it down as it toyed with them like a cat teasing its trapped prey. Desperate for a plan, Tom suggested using fire to drive it away or weaken its defenses. 
The team agreed and quickly rigged up a makeshift flamethrower. Moments before they implemented their plan, the creature attacked again with newfound ferocity, shredding through flesh and armor alike as if severed by a thousand razor-sharp blades. Battling back with sheer adrenaline-fueled determination, Tom wielded the makeshift flamethrower while the remaining members of his team held off the abomination's onslaught. The initial burst of fire seemed to have an effect. The creature howled in pain and paused as if reconsidering its approach. I could hardly breathe as the creature recoiled from the fire, its howls echoing in the chamber. It looked like something straight out of hell, grotesque, disgusting creatures stitched together to make one horrific abomination. Yellowed, cracked teeth protruded from its misshapen jaw, while bow-colored pus oozed from its bloodshot eyes. Its stench was unbearable, bringing on waves of nausea. My teammate, Sarah, was frantically searching for a way out of this nightmare. Tom! I think there's a door over there, she yelled, pointing to a dark corner. I didn't waste any time and commanded everyone to make their way toward it. As we sprinted toward the door, the creature turned its attention toward us once again. I wasn't about to let it tear through my friends after what we'd already endured. With newfound determination, I channeled all my energy into keeping it at bay with the makeshift flamethrower. Get that damn door open! I shouted to Sarah while my fingers clenched around the trigger. I'm trying. It's stuck. She yelled back, struggling with the rusted metal. The abomination saw an opening and charged at us with blinding speed. Julia tried her best to hold it off with her gun, but we all knew bullets did nothing against this devilish fiend. It was then that John, our engineer, who hadn't been able to do much during this madness, yelled above the cacophony. The fuel canisters. We can cause an explosion and take this thing down with us. It might be our only chance. Are you crazy? Michelle screamed, trying to fend off one of the creature's many limbs with her own weapon. Trust me. John insisted and started making his way toward where we stored extra fuel canisters near us. Adrenaline and terror raced through my veins as I made a split-second decision to put my faith in John. I tossed the flamethrower distracting the creature further. Sarah, Julia, and Michelle took advantage of the opening and squeezed through the door. As John grabbed a canister, I helped him place it near the creature. Our eyes locked for a brief moment, both of us knowing this was it. We rejoined the rest of our team in the next room just as the creature lunged for us one last time. In that split second before it could reach us, I lit a flare I had been saving for an emergency and tossed it at the canister. The explosion was deafening. He punched us in the face as we scrambled further away from the blast. We didn't spare a glance back as we raced forward. The next few days were grueling but mercifully devoid of that abhorrent creature. We stumbled across more sinister and gruesome signs of experimentation. Bodies left worse than before, but nothing alive, although that hardly seemed appropriate now. Sickened beyond measure and questioning our own sanity, we eventually navigated our way to freedom, bruised, bloody, and irreparably shaken. We called for extraction by our superiors, but none of us held any illusion that what happened here would ever be public knowledge. Our team was disbanded not long after. We drifted away from each other without ever being able to shake off what happened in that wretched place. Our lives would never be quite the same again. As for me, I focused on rebuilding my life on a day-by-day -day basis, always glancing over my shoulder with fear in the darkest corners. One old friend reached out to me on social media, Michelle. 
She didn't ask about others or anything related to that cursed experiment facility. Instead, she sent a single line. I think it's still out there. A chill settled upon me, and I knew one thing for certain. The nightmare wasn't over. It would never be over. The heavy backpack weighed me down as I trudged through the tangle of trees and shrubs that surrounded the remote area of the Hazelton Forest. My name is Vincenzo Portridge, and working for the United States Forest Service had its perks, but it also meant I had to endure these laborious periodic treks into the wilderness on Tuesdays. Today, November 23rd, something was different. A whisper of fear seemed to linger around every tree. I shrugged it off as residual stress from work and pressed on. My colleague, Jackson Kitts, chuckled at my irritation, adding a sarcastic remark about how nice it was to have a desk job. I retorted jokingly and pulled out a cigarette for us both. As we lit up and inhaled, a disquieting sensation crept up my spine something felt off. We couldn't put our finger on it until we stumbled upon a sight that sent chills down our spines. Blood stains splattered across leaves and scattered animal bones littered like morbid confetti. It looked as though the bones had been crushed methodically, as if with malicious intent. The areas around the carcasses were ransacked as well. Destroyed nests, and scratched treetops all spoke silently of a carnage we hadn't witnessed firsthand. We speculated about the attacker's identity, an escaped serial killer or perhaps a pack of poachers on a rampage. The grim scene only intensified our need to find answers. Though personally, my mind wandered to the local legend, the Wendigo of Hazelton Forest. The Wendigo was rumored to be an unfathomably tall, emaciated creature with intimidating antlers in place of a human head, feeding off wayward travelers who dared enter their forest domain. Pushing superstitious thoughts aside, we contacted some experts about what we found, the locals, hunters we knew from earlier assignments, and even a few wilderness guides. This collaborative inquiry painted a picture of an inhuman monstrosity capable of monumental carnage. As the days passed, our investigation led us deeper into the heart of darkness within Hazelton Forest. Tensions mounted with each passing step, dreading that whatever had taken those poor creatures' lives was still at large. Unease crept under our skin as we exchanged silent looks— each bearing the same suspicion. It was either man nor beast responsible for the chaos we uncovered. Then it happened, the moment that adorns my nightmares to this day. In front of us loomed a horrifying figure, gaunt and skeletal, crowned with imposing antlers that pierced through its sickly gray flesh. We froze in terror as the Wendigo bore down on us a lustful gleam shining in its milky eyes, glistening with a hunger that could never be quenched. I won't detail the gruesome encounters we had in the following month. Friends lost, lives irrevocably changed. Just be aware that despite our hasty attempts to avoid a fate worse than death, the Wendigo's grip tightened over time as a result of our hopelessness and fear. On December 23rd, Utterly exhausted and consumed by dread, I stared down from my dingy motel window overlooking the ominous tree line, at last, aware it wasn't coming for revenge or answers. It simply craved flesh. I was desperate for a plan that could potentially save us from the Wendigo's relentless pursuit. After discussing our options with Jackson— we decided that our best bet would be to gather any weapons and equipment we could find and set up traps to try and slow the creature down. We knew that it couldn't be killed, but perhaps we could hinder it enough to get ourselves out of the forest alive. On November 24th, 
We scavenged the forest for anything that could be used as a weapon or trap. We discovered a few gas cans, a rusty old bear trap, and some hunting knives that were most likely the leftovers of careless campers. Once armed, we began setting up traps in strategic locations throughout the forest, hoping to deter the Wendigo while buying us precious time. Two days later, on November 26th, our traps paid off. While hiding in an abandoned cabin deep within the woods, we heard a piercing screech that echoed through the trees, indicating that one of our traps had captured its prey. We peered out, and there it was, the Wendigo snagged in a bear trap, thrashing wildly in pain and rage. This was our chance. Heart pounding and adrenaline coursing through our veins, Jackson and I rushed out of the cabin. I doused any path leading towards us with gasoline, and created a makeshift barrier of fire between us and the creature. It seemed this momentary delay was enough for us to make a hasty retreat towards civilization while it struggled to break free from its trap. At 9.47 p.m. on November 27th, we finally emerged from Hazelton Forest. An overwhelming sense of relief washed over us as we stood there panting under the bright moonlight. The feeling was short-lived, though. We knew that it wasn't over. The horrifying events that unfolded days prior only fueled the beast's desire for more carnage. On the evening of December 1st, we were made aware of several missing person cases in a small town near the forest. The grisly discoveries of blood-stained trees and shredded clothing uncovered in its wake made it clear that the Wendigo was active again. Knowing that we could never truly escape the creature, Jackson and I made the decision to dedicate ourselves to researching and finding ways to minimize the destruction the creature caused. The gruesome attacks were evidence that we couldn't simply ignore its existence and hope for the best. We had a moral obligation to do everything in our power to help those who might still fall victim to it. On December 15th, we found ourselves back within Hazelton Forest, this time equipped with an arsenal of weapons and knowledge. Our investigations had led us to the understanding that, while killing the Wendigo might be impossible, there were ancient rituals and artifacts that could be used to contain it within certain boundaries. We spent days tirelessly performing these rituals, using symbols and markings all around the forest's perimeter. But on December 22nd, just as we finished one of our boundary carvings on an ancient tree, it appeared before us once more, eyes blazing with pure hatred, its demented scream piercing the cold air and rattling our fragile resolve. I knew none of us would leave this forest unscathed. It lunged towards us as we braced for impact, but then something miraculous happened. The barrier held firm. It couldn't get past our markings. It seemed trapped and infuriated, but at least now it was somewhat contained. It was on December 23rd that Jackson met his untimely end by attempting a final solution I couldn't support. In his desperation, he ventured into Wendigo's territory, his last words echoing throughout the treetops as he perished in agony. From my dingy motel room window, the horrors of the last month flood my mind as I watch over the now-contained domain of the Wendigo. I know that I have dedicated myself to an eternity of vigilance, to guarding and maintaining these boundaries in a never-ending struggle between man and monster. But as long as there's breath in my body, it shall not feast upon innocent souls any longer. For now, I'm confined to my duty— watch over this cursed place, ensuring that the Wendigo remains trapped behind the barriers we sacrifice so much to create. It craves flesh, but for now, it's contained. I was sitting around the campfire with my friends, 
joking and laughing as the soft light flickered over our faces. The five of us had decided to take a camping trip deep into the Appalachian Mountains, and I must admit, there was a part of me that relished the idea of escape from our mundane lives. Our group consisted of James, my childhood buddy, Connor and his girlfriend, Lauren, and Danny, who had the tendency to be annoying but was still loved by all. The date was July 13, 2016, and it was a warm summer evening in Morgantown, West Virginia. The sky overhead was incredibly clear and filled with stars. Despite the serenity of our surroundings, we couldn't help but feel uneasy about some recent events that took place nearby. There had been a series of strange attacks in this area over the past week, leaving locals with injuries too grisly to recount. Though none of them were reported dead by any press or authorities, news had reached our ears about what happened during these events. We didn't want to dwell on it, though, so we tried to concentrate on having fun. On a side note, did you know how much those cremated goat ashes sell for? We didn't want to find out either. As we were sharing stories from our childhoods, Connor began recounting a particularly absurd tale about his goat farming experiences when it happened, an unsettling noise echoed through the trees around us, a gut-wrenching scrape that made us collectively shudder. We all froze in our tracks, glancing at each other in uncertainty and growing trepidation trying to brush it off nonchalantly as just some animal that got startled walking through the woods around us wasn't successful. Danny mustered up some courage and called out tentatively, Hello? Is anyone there? But there was no answer, just an eerie silence lingering heavy in the air. We could feel the tension building amongst ourselves as we tried to remain calm. Suddenly, we heard rustling from the bushes behind us, and my heart nearly leapt out of my chest. A figure emerged, but instead of a terrifying sight, it was just a hiker who had been in the area for his own camping trip. He introduced himself as Greg and asked if he could join our group for a while. We welcomed him, glad to have someone else around to share our apprehension with. So now there were six of us around the campfire, each trying to put the recent reports out of our minds and focus on having a good time together with no worries about the unlikely and horrible things that might occur. As the night wore on, Connor grabbed his guitar and started strumming a light-hearted melody that lifted everyone's spirits. We even got Greg to chime in with his harmonica. Soon enough, all worry had evaporated, at least for me, considering what happened next would probably change our lives forever. James had gone off into the woods to relieve himself, and in his absence, ominous clouds rolled over us. The once evident stars disappeared under their suffocating presence. They seemed to spread an oppressive atmosphere over our formerly cheerful gathering. Minutes crawled by like molasses. Suddenly, James came stumbling out of the shadows, letting out an exhausted gasp that stopped all conversations dead in their tracks. He was pale and visibly shaken, clutching at his arm that was dripping crimson from deep gashes I'd never witnessed in my life. Without any prompt or request needed from us, he blurted out about seeing something unnatural an entity so horrifyingly twisted that he couldn't stand to describe it without choking back fear-filled tears. I glanced between my friends, their expressions dissimilar mixtures of terror and disbelief, before setting my gaze on Greg, who went pale as well. While we wanted to dismiss what James had seen as fabrication, the sincere fear in his eyes told a different story. None of us were armed or prepared for conflict with whatever was out there, but we had to do something. Grabbing what makeshift weapons we could find, 
Connor picked up a large branch while I clung for dear life onto my pocket knife, and Lauren took up an old iron skillet. We ventured into the dark woods as a silent promise hung heavy over us. We would face this sinister force as one. We cautiously made our way through the thick underbrush, our ears perked and straining to hear any sound that might signify the approach of the creature we had so fearfully dubbed the Skinner. The first time we heard about the Skinner was from our friend Mike, who worked at a local hardware store. He told us about the gruesome sight of skinned animals that started appearing around town. We never thought that one day we would come face to face with this terror. On Tuesday, at 2.15 p.m., we met at Lauren's house to discuss what we should do about the Skinner. After an intense debate, it was agreed that we would follow the trail of mutilated animals deeper into the forest and confront this twisted individual. Little did we know what awaited us in these dark woods. As we continued to move deeper into the forest, we noticed that the trees grew thicker and more twisted, almost as if they were trying to halt our progress. By 4.30 p.m., the sun had begun to set, causing shadows to elongate and drape across our path like sinister fingers reaching out for a grasp on our souls. Despite our fear, Lauren and I pressed onward. It was 6.45 p.m. when we came upon a small clearing where the remnants of what used to be several squirrels were strewn about. Their bodies were arranged in a sickening pattern, one that spelled out turn back. Both Lauren and I felt chills run down our spines, but we refused to let this sadistic message defeat us. At precisely 8.13 p.m., we finally caught sight of the Skinner. He stood tall, about six feet, wearing a tattered robe that barely concealed his grotesque physical form. His skin appeared slick and mottled, as though it were rotting right off his bones. The Skinner turned to face us, eyes bloodshot and full of rage. It was evident that he did not appreciate our intrusion into his vicious kingdom. Without warning, he rushed at us with a speed unnatural for a human being. Pulling out the pocket knife, I slashed at him as he got closer, cutting deep into his mottled flesh. Meanwhile, Lauren swung the skillet swiftly, smashing it into his skull with a reverberating clang. The Skinner staggered back momentarily stunned by the pain. His grotesque form couldn't be stopped so easily, though, and he lunged at us again. As I struck another swift blow with my knife, Lauren grabbed a nearby branch, using it to pin the Skinner against a tree. He let out an unholy screech that was so loud we were sure it would split our eardrums. Realizing that we couldn't hold him off for much longer, we chose to make our escape while we still had the chance. Leaving the Skinner pinned to the tree in gasping and agonizing fury, Lauren and I darted through the forest frantically, the fear of what could happen if he broke free driving us forward until our legs felt like they'd buckle beneath us. When we finally emerged from the woods hours later, our relief was palpable. Still shaking from our encounter with the Skinner, we knew that only fortune had granted us a chance to survive that harrowing ordeal. But as we recounted our experience to friends and authorities alike, it soon became apparent that this nightmare was far from over. News spread throughout town about the Skinner's presence in the woods surrounding our community, combining fear and curiosity amongst its residents. It wasn't long before more victims were found, this time not animal carcasses but mutilated human remains, leaving all of us questioning who could be next. Lauren and I never went back into those woods again. What had started out as mere curiosity morphed into sheer terror in a matter of hours with the horrifying face-to-face -face confrontation against the Skinner. The monster was never found, not by us nor by any subsequent search parties. 
Instead, the Skinner drove people mad with fear, his macabre status a morbid secret whispered amongst neighbors, friends, and family. Even today, years later, as the sun begins to set, casting ominous shadows through the dense thicket of trees that have long since become forbidden, we're left wondering not if but when the Skinner will strike again. I was living in a small cabin near Talkeetna, Alaska, working on my thesis about the indigenous communities of the state. The serenity and solitude of my surroundings helped me focus and get work done efficiently. However, it wasn't completely isolated. I had neighbors from time to time, fellow researchers, artists, and those seeking respite from the realities of their everyday lives. My nearest neighbor, Sarah, was an artist who often came by for dinner or to discuss her paintings. One evening after dinner, as we bid each other good night, Sarah said something that caught my attention. Be careful out here. There are things that can harm you in ways you wouldn't believe. I laughed it off, attributing her comments to an overactive imagination fueled by living alone in the Alaskan wilderness. But that night... As I lay in bed, unable to sleep, I thought about Sarah's words. The following week was monotonous, filled with research and writing. During one coffee break at a local spot, I overheard a group of locals discussing a man found injured near Mount McKinley, apparently attacked by some monstrous entity that couldn't be identified. The story piqued my interest but didn't shake me to my core. It wasn't until two weeks later that everything changed forever. I returned home one evening after spending hours at the library researching for my thesis. I noticed my door slightly ajar, and as I walked in, I could feel that something wasn't right. The lights were flickering, and an overwhelming scent of decay filled my cabin. Upon entering the main room, my brain struggled to process the sight before me. Splatters of dark red liquid stained the floor and walls, a thick concoction surely consisting of blood combined with unknown viscous materials. Trying to stay composed under tremendous distress, I cautiously stepped inside while scanning every corner for signs of danger. As I turned my gaze toward the window, I noticed a large handprint smeared across the glass, accompanied by an elongated set of jagged and cracked fingernails. Suddenly, a creak from the floorboards behind me made me jump in terror. A distinct, sloshing sound crept through the silence as I hesitantly turned around. My breathing hitched as my eyes widened in terror at the sight of a massive, hunched-over figure standing near the shadows in the corner. The creature was unimaginable. Its skin appeared to be a mix of human and animal, stitched together by some twisted mastermind. Its face was mostly concealed by an unkempt mane. However, yellow teeth protruded from a mouth full of mauled flesh. It stared at me with milky eyes full of malice and hunger. As my stomach churned at this horrendous scene, I realized that if I didn't act immediately, I would become its next meal. However, being trapped between this abomination and the only exit seemed like an impossible situation. In that frantic moment, something unexpected happened. Sarah burst into the room brandishing a baseball bat. The creature hissed in fury as it took a step toward her. Before it could react further... Sarah swung with all her strength at the grotesque being's head. The impact reverberated through the cabin while causing it to stumble sideways, giving us both a golden opportunity to escape unscathed. As we sprinted out into the night towards Sarah's cabin for safety, our hearts pounded in our chests upon knowing that we had been living alongside something truly sinister. As Sarah and I stumbled into her cabin, 
Gasping for breath, we quickly locked the door behind us. We then paced around the small space, desperately trying to piece together what had just happened. What the hell is that thing, Sarah? I asked, my voice coming out weak and shaky. I have no idea. I've never seen anything like it before in my life. She replied, fear etched clearly on her face. Her hands trembled as she fumbled for her phone. She dialed the number and urgently informed the person on the other end about our horrific encounter, detailing every gruesome aspect of it. Soon enough, they agreed to send help. While we awaited their arrival, we couldn't shake the feeling that our nightmare was far from over. The creature's grotesque appearance loomed over our thoughts like a thick mist. Its pale gray skin stretched tightly over its twisted frame, and its piercing black eyes seemed to penetrate straight into our souls. As we sat there huddled together for safety, I noticed that Sarah appeared to be fixated on a small photograph in her hand. It was a picture of a young man with strikingly familiar features, just like the monster outside. Before I could ask any questions about it, several pairs of headlights appeared through the cabin's window, and relieved, we eagerly greeted our rescuers. Police officers, accompanied by a team of experts, swept through both cabins and their surroundings with no sign of the malevolent creature. Gradually, my curiosity got the better of me regarding Sarah's photograph. Sarah, I began tentatively. Who's this guy in the picture? Her hands shook as she clutched it tightly. It's my brother Mark, she replied with hesitation. He went missing years ago. But I can't help but feel that whatever attacked us tonight, it bore an uncanny resemblance to him. Realizing the gravity of her suspicions, a cold shiver crept up my spine. We hesitated about sharing it with the authorities at first, but eventually knew it had to be done. The officers exchanged worn glances as they took the photograph and examined it carefully. Days went by, and the authorities discovered more gruesome scenes in the surrounding area, mutilated animals, damp and dingy tunnels leading nowhere, and even unsettlingly fresh humanoid tracks that appeared to be part human and part something else. But as quickly as the intense investigation had started, it began to dwindle. No solid leads were found, and certainly no capture was made. Eventually, the professionals we'd relied on packed their bags and returned to their daily lives. Reality sank in soon after, that perhaps this was a mystery that would never be solved. I decided to move out of my cabin for the foreseeable future, unable to shake the horrific memories that plagued me every night. Sarah continued living in her cabin but never stopped trying to understand what her brother had become if indeed that creature was Mark. As time went on, she claimed to see fleeting glimpses of the creature now and then, always lurking in the shadows just out of reach. Years passed, yet our lives remained tainted by this horrifying beast's existence, our minds relentlessly pondering, what did Mark go through to transform into such a monstrous being? And was it ever really him? As we helplessly strived for answers amidst this sinister enigma, one thing remained abundantly clear. Out there somewhere in those dark woods still lurked an unspeakable menace who haunted us ceaselessly. And though either Sarah nor I dared speak it aloud, we both silently wondered if our paths would ever cross again. Just a few days after my breakup, I decided to give Tinder a try. Complete with a catchy bio and a decent profile picture, I set out to explore the world of online dating in search of something casual and fun to help me move on. 
There I was, swiping left, right, and sometimes upward in confusion, trying my best to decipher the enigmatic bios like. Pancakes are better than waffles. It felt like an endless cycle of confusedly judging people based solely on their looks, which made me quite uncomfortable. I hesitated for a moment before swiping right on someone who stood out to me. With an uncanny knack for scrabble and mysterious green eyes that seemed to look right through you, this match seemed intriguing. After chatting for a few days, we agreed that we would meet up at our favorite coffee shop in Williamsburg. As I stepped into the cafe after work, I received a text saying that my date had arrived early and was waiting for me. Sitting at a table near the window was the elusive person behind the screen, with long hair that fell past their shoulders and an all-black outfit that accentuated their slim figure. We exchanged polite smiles as I approached the table. We spent hours talking about everything strange and peculiar, our mutual love for true crime podcasts, unexplained phenomena we'd encountered over the years, and the shared belief that pineapple pizza should be declared an abomination. As evening approached, my date suddenly steered our conversation towards urban explorations and abandoned buildings around Brooklyn. My Tinder date's voice became more urgent when they recalled their last harrowing encounter with an abandoned asylum just outside of town. They described wooden floors that groaned beneath them in protest as they tiptoed over broken glass scattered like glitter on dusty linoleum tiles. Each door creaked when pushed open, oblivious to decades of decay eating away at its hinges. Curious and slightly tipsy, I agreed when my date suggested that we explore the sinister building together. It seemed like a thrilling adventure to solidify our new connection. We arrived at the asylum by taxi. Its crumbling facade loomed ominously against the moonlit sky a concrete monster shrouded in shadows. As we wandered through the darkened halls, our flashlight beams flickered across graffitied walls that echoed with a tangible sense of dread. It wasn't long before we stumbled upon a locked room covered with rusty chains. My date playfully jingled the chains while they teased me about the horrors lurking just behind these bars. I could feel a cold sweat beginning to form as an uneasy feeling started to creep up on me. The floorboards seemed to be trembling beneath my feet as I looked into my date's now sinister green eyes, eyes that held no fear of the dark, no dread of what lay beyond those chains. Suddenly, they lunged towards me with unexpected speed and force, to loosen the door or eliminate their only witness— Horror filled every fiber of my being as our flashlight was knocked aside, casting us into total darkness. Behind the locked door, a faint sound could be heard, chilling laughter mixed amidst muffled sobs and screams that echoed through the damp corridors below us. And then, the sinister laughter grew louder and more intense— my heart raced as I realized that my date might not be as innocent as I had initially thought. We stood there for a moment, paralyzed and unsure of what to do next. My date's face suddenly relaxed, and they whispered, It's just a prank. They're friends of mine. But the fear I saw earlier in their eyes told me otherwise. I couldn't trust them anymore. We decided to turn back and make our way to the entrance, but as we moved farther from that chain door, we heard footsteps approaching. We hid behind a pile of debris and held our breath. A tall man with unkempt hair and bloodshot eyes walked by us. His name was Tom, the third party. He didn't notice us hiding, and we seized the opportunity to slip away quietly. We retraced our steps through the crumbling asylum, listening carefully for any sounds of pursuit. When we reached the exit, my date let out a sigh of relief, thinking we were safe at last. 
As I was about to step outside into the cool night air, something stopped me dead in my tracks. Blood stains on my date's jeans. I looked up at them in shock and betrayal and began to question who they really were, innocent victim or sadistic accomplice. Without giving me any answers, my date took off, running into the darkness without saying a word. A surge of adrenaline washed over me as panic set in. In the distance, I could see the taxi waiting for us, our own beacon of hope. With shaking legs and raw terror fueling me, I sprinted towards it and yelled for help. Just as we were about to leave the grounds of the asylum, Tom burst out from behind nearby trees. His teeth flashed menacingly in the cold light of my taxi's headlights while he wildly laughed. Tom hopped into a car that had pulled up behind mine, and I saw his sinister smirk in the rearview mirror as the driver sped after us. Terrified for my life, I asked the taxi driver to take random turns, trying to shake them off our tail. At each intersection we made desperate turns, hoping to lose our pursuers. But their car remained ever close on our heels. As the high-speed chase continued, precious seconds turned into minutes, and those minutes seemed like lifetimes. In a final attempt to escape Tom's clutches, the taxi driver made a sharp turn onto an unmarked dirt road before cutting off his headlights. As we drove in complete darkness, we finally lost sight of Tom's car behind us. After what felt like hours but was probably only a matter of minutes, the taxi pulled onto a desolate stretch of highway. I asked where we were heading, my home or the nearest police station. The driver replied gravely, You need to go home now. It's not safe for you out here. He refused to say anything else but provided me with enough information to know that Tom had been involved in similar incidents at the asylum before. I eventually arrived home safely but could not shake the horrifying encounter with my date and the man who had followed us. The feeling of terror never fully subsided, and though either Tom nor my date reappeared in my life, their malevolent presence lingered. As days turned into weeks and months went by, I kept replaying that night over and over again like an endless loop in my mind. Who was my date? Why had they taken me there? What did it mean that they knew Tom beforehand? Every time I close my eyes or hear a strange noise in the nighttime shadows, I can't help but question if Tom or that sinister being who pretended to be my date would ever come back for me. And so I am left forever haunted by that chilling night in the abandoned asylum, with no answers and only fear of the unknown. I peered around the corner my heart pounding in my chest as I took in the bizarre scene before me. I had been operating undercover for months in Abilene, Texas, and until today, it was just another routine assignment. But suddenly, my world had been turned upside down. My name is Kiefer Lawton, and being a CIA agent has given me experiences that most people would never believe. This current mission was nothing exceptional getting to know the inner workings of a local crime syndicate. It was all going well until everything went sideways one fateful evening. At first, I shrugged it off as a trick of the imagination. But then it happened again. Whispers of a creature called the Lurker, an urban legend used to scare small-town locals. It seemed unlikely that such a wild tale would hold any truth. But whatever was happening people were getting hurt. When one of my informants went missing, I couldn't sit idly by any longer. Alexei Morozov had been reliable for weeks, and his disappearance sent a shiver down my spine. Unsure whether the two events were connected, 
I decided to start investigating the creature's supposed hunting grounds. The setting sun cast eerie shadows across the dilapidated warehouse district where the lurker apparently stalked its victims. My instincts screamed at me to turn back but I inched closer to where Morozov was last seen. The only sounds I heard were those scuttling rodents and creaking metal. Suddenly, I heard a guttural snarl echoing through the darkness. It seemed impossible that this monstrous thing could be accurate, but there it was before me, the lurker. The creature resembled something out of H.P. Lovecraft's Nightmares. Its slimy tentacles oozed dark, fluid, and clung to whatever they touched. This horrifying monstrosity should have been the stuff of legends, yet it was real and a living nightmare that terrified me to my core. Once the initial shock wore off, my CIA instincts kicked in, and my goal became to survive this encounter and gather information on this creature. As I struggled to remain hidden, the lurker found its prey, a homeless man who had sought refuge in the shadows. Horrified, I watched as the lurker's tentacles sliced into him with disturbing ease, gutting him alive. The gory scene filled me with nausea and fear for what that creature could potentially inflict upon others. I had to find Morozov. There wasn't much time. The bloodlust of the lurker left little doubt that it would strike again soon. As careful as possible not to make a sound, I retraced my steps back to the burnout ruins of an old factory where Morozov was last seen. Every inch of the building screamed abandonment, but it seemed the most likely place to hold clues about both Morozov's disappearance and the lurker itself. After several minutes of searching, I spotted a dull glimmer in the darkness, and as I got closer, my breath caught in my throat. A bloody hook lay abandoned on the floor, unmistakable proof that this murderous creature was Alexei Morozov. My mind raced with all the possible reasons why this monster would have taken Morozov. Did he know too much? Was he involved in something darker than I'd initially realized? With a heavy heart filled with guilt at what might have happened to Alexei because of me, I knew I couldn't just let his fate remain a mystery. Confusion and dread coursed through me as I realized just how entangled in the lurker's web of violence I had become. Hearing footsteps approaching rapidly from outside, adrenaline flooded my system as I feared the lurker had returned for its grisly encore. Just as the silhouette appeared in the doorway, I leaped forward and tackled the figure to the ground. My heart raced as I realized it wasn't the lurker but an out-of-breath, clearly frightened man. Wait, it's me, Alexei, he gasped. I released my grip on him, puzzled. Alexei? What happened to you? He looked shaken. I managed to escape from that creature. You must leave now. Ignoring his warning, I decided to learn more about the lurker's nature. With Alexei's input, we started discussing the possible reasons behind its violent existence. As we spoke, I scrutinized the crime syndicate's actions during my undercover work. The pieces started coming together. Illegal experiments were conducted by the syndicate and whoever or whatever was behind the lurker might have a connection with them. Alexei revealed something unnerving. Several members of the crime syndicate had supposedly become immortal after submitting themselves to secret experiments. Now it made sense why the lurker never left a victim alive. It was likely hunting down these immortal criminals. Alexei confessed that he, too, had participated in this dark secret. Alexei! I exclaimed in shock. Why did you get involved in something as twisted as this? He hung his head in shame. Fear of death itself. It seemed like a golden opportunity. But now, with this thing on our tails, it's more of a curse than anything. 
I asked Alexei if there was any way to contain or weaken the lurker. He told me about the key, a crimson amulet infused with dark energy that the syndicate leader possessed. Without that amulet, the lurker would lose his invincibility and immortality and revert to being an ordinary human. We decided it was time to confront the leader and retrieve this key. But just as we were about to leave, the lurker emerged from the shadows, its reptilian eyes fastened on Alexei. You can't run forever, it hissed before lunging at us. I tackled Alexei out of the way and quickly set fire to distract the lurker. As it recoiled from the flames, Alexei recounted a potential weakness, sulfur mines located beneath the city. The lurker's aversion to fire ignited our hope. Perhaps sulfur would be even more effective. Navigating the underground tunnels was no easy feat, but haste was our friend as we moved toward our goal. Upon reaching the mines, we discovered a room filled with crates of raw sulfur, along with documents detailing unspeakable experiments carried out by the syndicate. In haste, we fashioned crude traps laced with sulfur to incapacitate the lurker. As if our very thoughts had summoned it, the lurker appeared in all its grotesque glory, its contorted form almost gleeful at the prospect of feasting on human flesh once again. It lunged at us, but this time we were prepared and activated our traps. As the lurker shrieked in agony, choking on sulfuric fumes, we watched in shock as its monstrous visage began to fade away. Before us stood a man, haggard and scared, who used to be the lurker. Alexei retrieved the amulet from the man's neck and gazed upon it remorsefully. What have we done? he muttered. Despite my conflicted feelings about him, I couldn't help but feel empathy. The once invincible monster before us slowly wilted away into nothingness, an uncanny demonstration of how human all those who succumbed to darkness were in their hearts. As for the crime syndicate, they were exposed, arrested, and brought to justice after a thorough investigation. The immortality granted by their dark experiments took its leave along with the amulet's possession. Returning to normalcy after what we had experienced was no easy task, but memories of the atrocities we witnessed remained as silent, nightmarish whispers in our minds. The journey we had embarked upon had come to an end, albeit an eerily somber one. My name is Alex, and I can't shake the feeling that I'm just one bad decision away from becoming a headline. Anyone can find themselves in a nightmarish situation, but honestly, who would have believed that mine could happen simply because of a wrong turn? It was the first weekend of July when my friends and I embarked on our annual summer road trip. We had meticulously mapped out our route— leading us across some beautiful areas in Idaho. However, despite all our planning, finding ourselves lost on some curvy country roads wasn't out of the question. On the second day of our trip, after driving through hours of winding mountain roads and breathtaking forests, we arrived at our cabin by the Clearwater River. After we got settled in, my friends headed inside while I stepped outside to take some photos for my social media feed. That's when I noticed several broken beer bottles lying around near the river. I didn't think much of it at first. After all, we were deep in the heart of party territory. But then I stumbled upon a torn and stained shirt covered with what looked like dried blood. The uneasy feeling began to settle in my stomach as I quickly snapped a couple more pictures and headed back inside. At dinner, my friends couldn't stop talking about how amazing the place was and how thrilling it would be to explore further into the wilds tomorrow morning. But all I could think about was that sickening discovery by the river. 
I debated telling them but decided not to ruin everyone's evening over what probably had an innocent explanation. Before embarking on our hike the following day, we encountered a man at a small local store stocking up on supplies for his own outdoor adventure. Sporting unkempt hair and ragged clothes harping back to simpler times, he seemed very excited to chat with anyone who crossed his path. As we entered the unfamiliar trail later that afternoon, everything seemed just as grand and picturesque as we'd hoped. The presence of that man, though, called up a growing sensation of unease that I couldn't quite shake. We pressed deeper into the forest, losing track of time as we took detours and shortcuts, laughing and joking along the way. Just as the sun began to set, indicating our need to head back, my friend Emma discovered something gruesome under a nearby bush, a human hand, dismembered and gnawed on by some wild beast. Instantaneously, our laughter ceased. Every one of us stood frozen, staring at the grisly sight in disbelief. Emma let out a trembling gasp and clutched her chest as the rest of us exchanged panicked glances. Our once delightful hike had transformed into a morbid crawl space through shadows filled with chills and hidden terror. We knew we had to get out of there fast, but as we stumbled through the darkening wilderness in haste, we couldn't help but feel hunted. My thoughts kept racing back to that strange man from the store. What was his story? Did he know something about this hand that lay severed in front of us? My thoughts were interrupted by none other than the man himself stepping out from behind a large tree further ahead on our path, armed with an enormous cleaver stained with fresh blood. Our eyes met for just a moment before he lunged towards me. The others screamed as I darted backward and barely escaped the swing of his cleaver. My friends and I ran through the forest hearts pounding and limbs shaking from fear and exertion. We heard the man's heavy footsteps following behind us, cursing and shouting. We finally spotted a beaten-down cabin hidden among the trees that we hadn't noticed on our way in. We rushed inside to take cover, desperate for protection from our deranged pursuer. As we locked the door and barricaded ourselves in, I caught my breath and tried to calm down. The terror was overwhelming, but I needed to think rationally to find a way out of this situation. Emma was nursing her own wound, a deep gash across her arm from a clumsy fall while running. What the hell is this guy's problem? Jake muttered, his eyes darting around the room for anything we could use as a weapon or an escape route. Suddenly, we heard pounding on the door. It was him again. You better come out here now, he howled with an intensity that made us grip each other in terror. We stayed perfectly still, hoping he'd give up and leave. The minutes ticked by excruciatingly slowly, each second feeling like an eternity, as we huddled together in fear. Mustering all my courage, I peered through a crack in the boarded-up window just as his face came into full view, eyes wild with rage and mouth twisted into a snarl. Finally, several hours later, or at least it felt like hours, he seemed to accept defeat. The pounding stopped, and we could hear his footsteps receding into the distance. Still filled with dread but desperate for help, we removed our makeshift barricade and ventured back outside. The forest looked completely different in the dark. It felt like an alien planet compared to our daytime exploration mere hours before. Quietly retracing our steps back to civilization by moonlight, we stumbled across another group of hikers, looking just as terrified as us. They told us they were attacked by the same maniac and had also managed to escape his deadly grip. The horrifying realization dawned on us that this man was not a lone wolf, 
He was part of a larger problem plaguing the idyllic forest we had initially come to explore. At long last, we reached the small store where we'd met the man earlier. Rushing inside, we found the shopkeeper behind the counter. Between gasps for air, I told him about our harrowing encounter and asked if he knew anything about the man who had tried to kill us. He hesitated before telling us he'd heard whispers about a man named Jeremiah living up in the hills since his family was murdered years ago by some reckless campers. Driven mad with grief, Jeremiah vowed revenge on everyone encroaching on what he saw as his territory. The gruesome hand we discovered must have been one of his previous victims. With the grim reality of our situation setting in, we knew it was time to leave these wilds immediately. Our summer adventure had turned into a haunting nightmare that would stay with us forever. As we pulled away from the store and accelerated down the narrow road out of town, I couldn't help but glimpse one last look at the forest in my rearview mirror, an eerie terrain hiding horrific secrets just out of view. We could never be sure if Jeremiah had truly given up or if he was waiting to torment his next unsuspecting victims. My camping trips always felt routine, similar to a well-rehearsed play where every line in action had its place, like clockwork. Each time we'd gather our gear and set out to enjoy the great outdoors, it seemed almost like a mirror image of the last trip. However, on this particular outing with my family, our comfortable camping world was about to be turned upside down. It began when we took a detour from our usual campsite to explore an untamed area in the Appalachian Mountains, feeling drawn to being off the beaten path. The first evening went by without issue. We built a campfire, roasted marshmallows, and shared light-hearted stories late into the night, amused by my father's offbeat sense of humor. Eager for a decent night's sleep before our hike the following day, we all retired to the safety and comfort of our RV. The abrupt sound of an object crashing onto our RV in the early hours of the morning shattered any hope of a restful slumber. I groggily opened my eyes, blinking at the dim light filling the camper from the crescent moon's glow outside. Soon after, another thud echoed through the small space. My mother sat up in her sleeping bag, clutching her phone tightly. Fred, she hissed quietly to my father. I think someone's outside. His response was swift but subtle as he grabbed his heavy iron flashlight for protection. Dad crept toward the door and carefully peered through a crack in the curtains before turning back to us with an ashen expression on his face. There's a man out there, he whispered faintly. We huddled together as we listened to heavy footsteps crunching leaves outside as they circled our RV. Suddenly, we heard him speak in a harsh tone that made our blood run cold. I know you're in there. He commenced banging on the door with what sounded like a flurry of punches, each impact shaking the entire RV. I couldn't understand why this was happening. We were just a regular family seeking a weekend escape. My younger sister stifled her cries while Mom hugged her close. Dad seemed to be sizing up the situation, mumbling something under his breath about the man outside, possibly a local with ill intentions. He nudged me to move towards the front of the RV, where we both fumbled for our phones, urgently calling for help. We could only hope that someone in law enforcement would reach us in time as the relentless pounding continued. Breaking and entering? I hear that's a great bonding activity for families. My father strained to jest, trying to muster some levity in such dire circumstances. But it wasn't enough to break through our overwhelming fear, which threatened to choke us. 
Minutes felt like eternal hours as the man persisted in his attempt to break into our once safe haven. Everything we had known about camping was shattered, forcing us to confront an unpredictable and menacing reality. A sudden realization struck me. The man had stopped pounding at the door. Though relief should have washed over me, my chest tightened further as silence filled the air. It was replaced by faint laughter coming from multiple directions, swirling around and enveloping us. I recalled hearing whispered tales around campfires about notorious groups that lurked in these mountains, notorious for terrorizing unsuspecting individuals. The vague descriptions filled my mind with images of burly men with sinister grins plastered across their weathered faces. In that moment, we knew we couldn't wait any longer for help. As quietly as possible, Dad instructed us to round up our essentials and prepare to make a daring exit out of the rear door of the RV in an attempt to circumvent the growing danger lurking just beyond our walls. We were about to step into harrowing darkness when suddenly I froze in place, sensing the eerie atmosphere grow heavier around us. The faint laughter echoing through the mountains seemed to grow louder, unnerving us all. Dad motioned for us to follow him towards the rear door of the RV, and we made our escape as silently as possible. Moments later, we found ourselves hidden among tall tree lines outside our RV. Dad pulled out a map and pointed to a small cabin marked on it, whispering that we should head there for temporary safety. My little sister held on to my hand tightly as we followed Dad's lead, moving deeper into the forest. We had been walking for what felt like hours when I noticed a sickening stench infiltrating my nose, making me gag. It wasn't long before we stumbled upon an open clearing where several mutilated bodies lay scattered on the ground, their lifeless eyes staring blankly into nothingness. The gruesome sight made my younger brother vomit behind a nearby bush. Dad directed us towards a girl shivering against a tree nearby. She looked half-starved and terrified but began to speak softly as soon as she saw my dad's kind expression. Those men, they call their leader Hank, she whispered. He's violent and relentless. They won't stop until they have claimed your lives, too. We knew then that our situation was far worse than we could have imagined. Feeling utterly overwhelmed by the brutal reality of our circumstances, we continued toward the safety of the cabin indicated on my dad's map. At least we hoped it was safe there. Once inside the cabin, my dad barricaded the door with whatever furniture we could find and assigned us each task to secure our temporary shelter. The windows needed boarding, weapons and first aid kits needed to be gathered, everything important that could help us stay alive in this nightmarish scenario. Hours passed with not much incident. However, at precisely 9.06 p.m. on August 10th, an ear-splitting wail erupted from outside. The sound was followed by pounding footsteps, heavy breathing, and the agonizing screams of regretful human beings. The cabin violently shook as bodies were tossed against its walls. The sound of shattered bones and possessed laughter sickened us to our core. Knowing we were trapped like rats inside, my father made the heartbreaking decision that rendered me speechless. He would go out to confront Hank, along with any other lingering villains. Instead of a goodbye filled with sentimental tears or meaningful embraces, which wouldn't help any of us through these trying times, Dad simply caressed each of our faces with a firm grip and told us to take care. We all trembled inside the cabin waiting for whatever would come next. Hours dragged by like days, until finally, the unnatural noises and grotesque sounds ceased altogether. Silence infiltrated the night once again. Goosebumps crawled across my skin as my family, and I contemplated our next move. 
Could it really be over? Had Dad stopped them, or was this merely another twisted game? We finally decided to exit the cabin cautiously, prepared for whatever awaited us. As we crept through the woods in search of our father, or even just some sign or clue, we stumbled upon a handwritten note pinned to a tree with a bloody knife. I felt bow rising in my throat as I read aloud. The game has only just begun. Hank, what was this? Were these deranged men and Hank anticipating our every move? Were we being hunted by some group that thrived on fear and murder? Despair seeped into my mind as I thought of our grim situation, but determination surged in my veins. We would find Dad at all costs. We owed him that much. With hopelessness clinging to our hearts like dead leaves on an autumn branch, every step forward felt heavier than the last. The unsettling laughter still echoed faintly somewhere in the distance, leaving us wondering if Hank's haunting message was merely the beginning of a never-ending nightmare. I had planned the perfect camping trip for my friends and me. The idea was an escape from the monotony of daily life, a chance to breathe some fresh air, and most importantly, have fun. Summer 2014 was all about making memories. Little did I know that those memories would haunt me for years to come. The motley crew assembled was me, Jake Redmond, Eddie Vasquez, Marnie Lewis, and Ellie Graham, some high school friends and their partners. We decided on Shenandoah National Park in Virginia for our getaway. Apparently, it had some fantastic scenic views and hiking trails that would be perfect for a group like ours. We arrived on a Saturday in early July, having planned to stay until Tuesday morning before we had to return to work. The first day went without a hitch. We set up our tents in a nice clearing near a stream around noon. Afterward, we went for an easy hike along one of the park's many trails. It felt good to get out into nature and flex muscles that had been dormant for far too long. As dusk approached, we returned to our campsite to cook dinner over the fire pork and veggie skewers with grilled pineapple as a side dish. Delicious smells filled the clearing as we laughed and reminisced about our time together in school. The night continued with stories shared around the fire and jokes that left us all holding our sides as we laughed uncontrollably. Ellie then suggested a game of truth or dare which descended into harmless shenanigans spiced up by some adult beverages. As our evening wound down and the fire burned low, each of us began retreating back to our tents in varying stages of intoxication and exhaustion from activities earlier in the day. But what happened next turned an ideal weekend getaway into a horror story. It must have been close to 3 a.m. when Marnie woke up screaming at the top of her lungs. The sound was bone-chilling and shook me out of my deep sleep. I bolted out of my tent only to witness Eddie's body convulsing uncontrollably on the ground by the dwindling fire. Marnie's hands were shaking as she tried to dial 911 on her phone, but there was no signal. In a panic, I rushed over to see if I could help Eddie in any way. Upon inspection, there were strips of his flesh that had been meticulously sliced from his limbs. It wasn't a simple animal attack, but something far more sinister. Turning around in a daze, I saw it, a person or thing lurking at the edge of the campsite obscured by shadows but tall and clothed in black rags that hung off its slender frame. Its silhouette seemed to bend and flicker unnaturally. Adrenaline coursed through my veins as I yelled at everyone to get up and run. We needed to escape this nightmare and find help. Mostly disoriented from sleep or fear, 
my friends stumbled into action, realizing the gravity of the situation as they witnessed Eddie's mangled body. We took off into the darkness, with only the sounds of our own breaths and frightened footfalls echoing around us. As we sprinted through the woods, we could hardly see anything, but our instincts kept us moving forward. The cold air and the sharp branches whipping our faces did not seem to faze us. Even though we had no idea where we were going, all that mattered was that we were trying to escape that monster. Suddenly, almost as if on cue, we heard a faint and shaky voice carried by the wind. It sounded like an elderly man repeating the name, Silas. Danny looked back at me, and I nodded at him with the same sense of realization. The monster must be called Silas, and someone must have encountered him before. We finally reached the road at the edge of the forest. My heart felt like it was going to explode from my chest until I spotted a diner up ahead. We practically collapsed into the building, instantly becoming aware of the stares from people around us. It took a while before an old man approached our group, his eyes filled with fear and recognition as he said, You met Silas too, didn't you? We stared at him silently, struggling to comprehend how he knew who we were talking about. The old man led us to an out-of-service gas station in the town. It was there that he told us the horrifying story of Silas, an infamous escaped criminal mutilated beyond recognition in an accident that nearly killed him. Ever since that accident, Silas has roamed these woods at night seeking vengeance, brutally attacking unwary victims in retaliation for his condition. The old man explained that he'd helped some previous victims escape, but stayed behind because there wasn't enough room in their getaway car. He didn't want anyone else to suffer Silas' wrath, but he wasn't brave enough to confront him himself. After hearing this tale, we knew what needed to be done. Even if we couldn't personally face Silas' raw power, it was our duty to warn others about him instead. We thanked the old man and decided to find the authorities to report Silas' presence in the woods. However, when we arrived at the police station, they dismissed our story with a chuckle. They believed that we were just paranoid kids who had watched too many horror movies. It seemed like nobody would take us seriously, but we couldn't just stand there and do nothing. We went back to the diner where we'd first met the old man. We were determined to strike a deal with him. He would remain behind once again while we drove out of town to find help from another police department, someone who would listen to us and take on this monster. Frustrated but grateful, the old man agreed, and we made our way to our vehicle. As we loaded up and prepared to leave, I glanced at my watch. It read 6.43 p.m. The sun had set completely, leaving us in darkness. Our hearts pounded as we raced out of town. That ominous feeling loomed over us like a black cloud. Silas was still out there in those woods, lurking in the dense darkness, waiting for his next victim. 